discussion on important aspects of acute aortic regurgitation. Hemodynamics and findings in acute aortic regurgitation are significantly different from the familiar picture of chronic aortic regurgitation. Due to the atypical findings, it may be difficult to diagnose acute aortic regurgitation. All the same, it is not a stable condition like chronic AR. Acute regurgitation can rapidly progress to heart failure and early mortality if left untreated. Important causes of acute AR are infective endocarditis, aortic dissection, and rarely trauma. Rare causes reported are necrotizing granulomatous inflammation of the aortic wall in rheumatoid arthritis and avulsion of aortic wall commissure and spontaneous rupture of a fibrous strand in fenestrated aortic wall. Pathophysiology of acute AR is characterized by the sudden volume overloading of the left ventricle which is unprepared and has a normal size. In chronic AR, left ventricle dilates progressively when AR progresses as the left ventricle gets time to accommodate the additional volume load. In acute AR, there is a rapid increase in LV diastolic pressure which approaches the aortic diastolic pressure. This causes mitral wall pre-closure in diastole. Premature closure of the mitral wall prevents transmission of elevated left ventricular diastolic pressure to the pulmonary veins and hence pulmonary edema. But when the LV diastolic pressure rises further, this protection is lost and the mitral wall opens in late diastole causing diastolic mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation can extend to the isovolumic contraction period and early systole when the LV diastolic pressure is very high. Left atrium serves as a reservoir to decompress the left ventricle in acute AR. But this compensatory mechanism can also fail soon when AR progresses leading to pulmonary edema. Premature closure of mitral valve in acute AR is demonstrated on M-mode echocardiography. Premature mitral valve closure was graded as plus when it occurred before the QRS but after the P wave. When it occurred before the P wave, it was graded as plus plus. These have been called as grade 1 and grade 2 by other authors. Grade 2 premature closure of mitral valve can occur up to 200 milliseconds before the QRS while grade 1 is up to 50 milliseconds before the QRS. The classical decrescendo early diastolic murmur and peripheral signs of chronic aortic regurgitation are not found in acute AR. An early diastolic murmur, if it is heard, is usually softer and shorter in acute AR. A soft to and fro murmur may be heard in acute AR. Murmur can be absent and the heart sounds quite soft or absent sometimes, leading to a silent precordium. Auscultatory timing of heart sounds are difficult because of their softness and shortening of diastole, often shorter than systole. Systole becomes longer because of prolonged systolic ejection time as the left ventricle is overloaded. Mitral valve closes prematurely and opens late because of prolonged systole. It has been suggested that those with grade 2 premature closure of mitral valve should undergo early aortic valve replacement. Aortic regurgitation in Stanford type A aortic dissection has several mechanisms and they have implications for repair. Five potential mechanisms are 1. Incomplete closure of leaflets due to tethering by a dilated sinotubular junction. 2. Leaflet prolapse due to disruption of attachment by dissection flap. 3. Prolapse of dissection flap through the wall leaflets preventing leaflet coaptation. 4. Bicuspid aortic wall and associated leaflet flaps unrelated to the dissection process. 5. Degenerative leaflet thickening leading to abnormal leaflet coaptation. First three can be considered for repair without replacement of the valve. Here are the first set of references on acute aortic regurgitation. Second set of references are here. These are the third set of references. Acute aortic syndromes include aortic dissection, aortic intramural hematoma and penetrating ulcer of the aorta. They are an important differential diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome.
The concept of acute aortic syndrome was introduced by Villa Costa and colleagues in an editorial which appeared in Heart in 2001. The nature and location of pain are important in the diagnosis of acute aortic syndrome. Usually, it is an intense tearing type of pain and the location may change as the disease progresses as in aortic dissection. Pain in the front of the chest, neck or throat suggests ascending aortic involvement while pain in the back or over the abdomen suggests involvement of the descending thoracic or abdominal aorta. Most of the acute aortic syndromes are associated with significant hypertension, though aortic dissection may have a background of diseases like Marfan syndrome. Aortic dissection is by far the most well known of the acute aortic syndromes. In the Stanford classification of aortic dissections, Type A involves ascending aorta while type B does not involve the ascending aorta. In DBAKI classification, type 1 involves the ascending aorta, arch and the descending aorta. DBAKI type 2 aortic dissection involves only the ascending aorta while DBAKI type 3 is confined to the descending aorta. Aortic dissection can extend either anterogradely or retrogradely and involve the side branches. Myocardial infarction can result if the coronary ostium, usually right coronary, is involved. Aortic regurgitation is another aftermath of ascending aortic dissection. Dissection can also lead to hemopericardium with cardiac tamponade. Progression may stop if there is a spontaneous re-entry into the lumen. Similarly, in the long term, the thrombosis of false lumen can lead to good result. Aortic intramural hematoma is usually the result of rupture of a vasa vasorum in the aortic media. It can lead on to dissection if hematoma ruptures. Just like an aortic dissection, hematoma can also extend along the length of the aorta, either anterogradely or retrogradely. Ascending aortic hematoma will present with chest pain, while descending aortic hematoma may present with pain in the back or abdomen. It is not possible to differentiate aortic hematoma from aortic dissection clinically as it needs imaging to confirm and exclude dissection which has similar symptomatology. Ulceration can occur in atherosclerotic plaques of the aorta. This can lead on to aortic dissection or intramural hematoma. These ulcers can deepen and result in aortic perforation with catastrophic results. Penetrating ulcers like intramural hematoma need imaging studies for documentation. More and more cases of penetrating ulcer of the aorta are being documented with widespread use of multi-slice CT aortograms. Here are a few important references for acute aortic syndromes. Few more references are here. Anatomical considerations of the metal wall are important while considering metal wall repair either surgically or by percutaneous transcatheter techniques. The mitral wall complex consists of the mitral annulus, mitral wall leaflets, the caudate tintine and the papillary muscles. The mitral leaflets are the anterior and posterior leaflets. The posterior leaflet has three scallops named P1, P2 and P3. The commissures of the mitral wall are the anterolateral and the posteromedial commissures. The papillary muscles are the anterolateral and the posteromedial papillary muscles. The P1 scallop is near the anterolateral commissure and the P3 scallop near the posteromedial commissure with the P2 scallop in the middle. As P1 scallop is near the anterolateral commissure, it is known as the anterolateral scallop or lateral scallop. P3 scallop is near the posteromedial commissure and is known as the posteromedial scallop or medial scallop. P2 is known as the central scallop. Professor Alan Carpentier was one of the pioneers in mitral wall repair who introduced the nomenclature of mitral scallops. Though the anterior leaflet does not have well-defined scallops like the posterior leaflets, there are corresponding named segments known as A1, A2 and A3. The caudate indinae are of three types, primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary cordae attach to the tips of the mitral leaflets, while the secondary cordae connect the rough zone of the leaflets to the papillary muscles. The secondary cords are also known as strut cords. The tertiary cordae are attached to the basal region of the mitral leaflets 
and connect to the ventricular free wall. The tensing of the cardiopapillary system during systole has an important role in the competence of the mitral valve in preventing regurgitation. Here are some important references on the scallops and cardae of mitral valve. Discussion on Carpentia nomenclature of mitral leaflet scallops. Carpentia nomenclature of mitral leaflet scallops is important in assessing the mitral leaflets while planning mitral wall repair. The scallops can be identified well by transesophageal echocardiography, preferably in three dimensional mode. Two indentations in the posterior leaflet divides it into three independently mobile scallops named P1, P2 and P3. Anterior leaflet is non-indented but has been divided into three corresponding virtual subdivisions known as A1, A2 and A3. Normal mitral valve in parasternal short axis view, RV right ventricle, IVS interventricular septum, AML anterior mitral leaflet, PML posterior mitral leaflet, LVPWO left ventricular posterior wall. Two indentations and three scallops of posterior mitral leaflet are seen. Posterior leaflet has a quadrangular shape while the anterior leaflet has semicircular shape. These can be visualized well by a magnified three dimensional echocardiographic image. Systolic billowing of the mitral leaflets into the left atrium is rather uniform with an exception of P1 and P2 region. P1 has a single focus of regional heterogeneity in the curvature while P2 has two large foci of heterogeneity in curvature. This may be the reason why these two segments that is P1 and P2 have a higher propensity for prolapse and becoming flail. Professor Alain Carpentier was one of the pioneers in mitral wall repair who introduced the nomenclature of mitral scallops. Here are some relevant journal references. Discussion on basic principles of rotablation or rotational etherectomy. Rotational etherectomy uses a diamond coated burr to debulk complex atherosclerotic plaques which are difficult to treat with conventional balloon angioplasty. The physical principle of rotablation is differential cutting. The advancing rotablator burr selectively cuts inelastic material while elastic tissue deflects away from the burr. As 95% of the particles generated by rotablation are less than 5 microns in diameter, they are removed from the body by the reticuloendothelial system. Thus, the basic principle of rotablation is quite different from balloon dilatation in which there is displacement of atherosclerotic plaque with multiple tasks. Though it was initially used as a debulking strategy, later the emphasis was on plaque modification prior to stent implantation. Rotablation facilitates percutaneous coronary intervention for de novo complex lesions with severe calcification. Bar to artery ratio of 0.5 to 0.6 and rotational speed of 140,000 to 150,000 rpm have been suggested. The bar should be advanced gradually with a pecking motion, quick push forward and pull back movement of the bar. Short ablation runs of 15 to 20 seconds and avoidance of decelerations more than 5000 rpm are also suggested. Other adjunctive measures are the use of antiplatelet agents, vasodilators, flush solutions and temporary pacing, vasopressors and mechanical support when needed. Due to changes in conceptual understanding of the basic principles of rotablation, the tendency to use it has come down from the 20% in mid 1990s to 1-3% to a quarter century after the introduction of the device. There are advantages for using intravascular ultrasound and optical coherence tomography to guide rotational etherectomy. IVAS is useful to understand guide wire bias and to decide on appropriate size of burr for the procedure. OCT gives an idea about the thickness of the calcification in the lesion. Good lesion preparation by rotablation prior to the delivery of stent can be useful in avoiding damage to polymer of the drug eluting stent in calcified lesions. Bradycardia or atrioventricular block 
may occur during rota ablation, especially in case of right coronary artery and need temporary pacing. Short ablation times can reduce the risk of sustained arrhythmia. Risk of ventricular perforation with temporary pacing lead has to be borne in mind while inserting the lead. Cough resuscitation may be useful in an emergency to combat transient bradycardia. System should not be deactivated when the burr is in the middle of the stenosis. Deactivation when the burr is in the middle of the stenosis can result in entrapment of the burr. The system should be deactivated after the burr is pulled back into the platform. Rotablator burr sizes range from 1.5 to 2.5 mm and burr speeds range from 140,000 to 190,000 rpm. Rota wire guide wires have 0.009 inch and 0.014 inch tip. Compressed air or nitrogen is used to spin the drive shaft and the burr. It is pumped through a pneumatic hose into the advancer to rotate the turbine housed within it. Discussion on calculation of intracardiac shunts by cardiac cath and flam formula. Pulmonary blood flow is designated as QP and systemic blood flow as QS in hemodynamic calculations. When there is a left to right shunt, pulmonary blood flow is more than systemic blood flow. The systemic blood flow is more than pulmonary blood flow when there is a right to left shunt. Calculation of shunt ratio is useful in deciding the operability of shunt lesions as well as their hemodynamic significance. In the absence of significant pulmonary hypertension, a left to right shunt of less than 1.5 is to 1 may be left alone if at the atrial or ventricular level. But even a small left to right shunt due to patent ductus arteriosus is closed by a device or coil nowadays. Left to right shunt is equal to QP minus QS. QP by QS is equal to SiO2 minus MVO2 divided by PVO2 minus PaO2. MVO2 is calculated using the flam formula 3 SVC oxygen content plus 1 IVC oxygen content whole divided by 4. QP by QS is the ratio of pulmonary to systemic blood flow. It will be more than 1 in left to right shunts and less than 1 in right to left shunts. SiO2 systemic arterial oxygen saturation MVO2 mixed venous oxygen saturation PVO2 pulmonary venous oxygen saturation PaO2 pulmonary arterial oxygen saturation Effective blood flow is calculated when there is a bidirectional shunt. Effective pulmonary blood flow is the volume of unoxygenated blood flowing through the lungs which is the volume which actually participates in the respiratory gas exchange. Effective pulmonary blood flow will be QP minus Q left to right. In pure left to right shunt, this value will be equal to the systemic blood flow. Here is a journal reference for the topic. Cardiac cycle consists of all events occurring in the heart during a systole and the following diastole. Clinically, systole starts from the first heart sound and ends at the onset of the second heart sound. Diastole is between the second heart sound and the next first heart sound. Typically, a cardiac cycle lasts 0.8 seconds. Sequence of opening and closing of the valves follow this dictum. Right-sided valves open first and close late. So, if you are starting with systole, mitral valve closes at the onset of systole followed by tricuspid valve. This gives the M1-T1 sequence when there is a split first heart sound. Interval after the atrioventricular valve closure and the opening of the semilunar valves constitute the isovolumetric contraction time. Next, the pulmonary valve opens followed by the aortic valve. At the end of systole, aortic valve will close first and pulmonary valve next giving the A2-P2 sequence for a split S2. Interval between the closure of the semilunar valve and the opening of the AV valves 
constitute the isovolumetric relaxation period. This is followed by the opening of the tricuspid and mitral valves in sequence. Phases of the cardiac cycle are classically described in relation to the Vigors diagram which incorporates drawings of phonocardiogram, ECG and pressure tracings of the atrium, ventricle and aorta as well as ventricular volume curve. The diagram has been in use for over a century with initial publication by Carl Vigors in 1915. Isovolumic contraction phase starts at the peak of the QRS complex in the ECG. As soon as the left ventricular pressure starts rising, the mitral wall closes. After a short while, when the left ventricular pressure becomes more than the aortic diastolic pressure, the aortic wall opens. The period during which both mitral and aortic valves are closed and the ventricle is in systole is known as isovolumic contraction phase. First heart sound is heard when the mitral wall closes at the onset of isovolumic contraction phase. In the ejection phase, the blood is ejected into the aorta once the aortic wall opens. After an initial period of rapid ejection, while the ventricle continues to contract, there is a period of reduced ejection when the ventricle starts relaxing. The ejection phase ends when the aortic wall closes. This event is marked by the second heart sound. Isovolumic relaxation phase starts with the closure of the aortic wall and ends with the opening of the mitral wall. Rapid inflow phase Initial part of diastole in which there is rapid inflow of blood into the ventricle ends with S3 if one is present. Ventricular volume rises steeply in the initial part of this phase. Next phase in diastole is the diastasis during which there is very little change in the ventricular volume and there is almost equalization of ventricular and atrial pressures. In mitral stenosis, diastasis is absent as there is a constant gradient across the mitral valve. Atrial systole Towards the end of diastole, there is a further increase in atrial and ventricular pressures and ventricular volume with atrial contraction. This is how atria act as a booster for ventricular filling. This is the time of pre-systolic accentuation of the murmur in mitral stenosis due to the enhanced flow across the mitral valve. This is absent in atrial fibrillation. Atrial systole starts at the peak of the P wave on the electrocardiogram accounting for the initial electromechanical delay. Electrical systole of the heart With respect to the ECG, systole starts at the peak of the QRS accounting for the initial electromechanical delay. Systole ends at the end of the T waves, so both ventricular depolarization except a small initial portion and repolarization is complete during systole. Here is the reference on Vigors diagram. Discussion on choral study on stenting in atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. In the choral study, 947 patients who had atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis and either systolic hypertension while taking two or more antihypertensive medications or chronic kidney disease were evaluated. It was a multi-center, open-label, randomized controlled trial. Patients were randomized to either medical therapy plus renal artery stenting or medical therapy alone. Previous randomized trials on renal angioplasty had failed to show significant benefit in control of blood pressure. Another two randomized trials checking the effect of renal artery stenting in atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis did not show any benefit with respect to kidney function. Adverse cardiovascular and renal events were checked in the choral study. Composite endpoint was death from cardiovascular or renal causes, myocardial infarction, stroke, hospitalization for congestive heart failure, progressive renal insufficiency or need for renal replacement therapy. Median follow up period in the trial was 43 months. There were no significant differences in all cause mortality or individual components of the primary composite endpoint between the study and control groups. There was a modest decrease of systolic blood pressure in the stenting group, mean of 2.3 mm of mercury.
final data reported was from 931 participants after excluding one center due to quality issues. Others were considering whether the medical therapy given to coral participants can be replicated in clinical practice to reap similar benefits. The medical therapy in the study included angiotensin receptor blocker with or without a thiazide diuretic and amlodipine for control of blood pressure. The patients received antiplatelet agents and aterostatin also. The trial had enrolled patients with renal artery stenosis of 60% or more. Though this might be considered as a limitation, there was no benefit among the participants with more than 80% stenosis either. Another potential issue was the 210 patients excluded by the physicians. It is likely that physicians felt that they may benefit from stenting due to the severity of the disease. Coral study complements the findings of the Astral and STAR trials which did not find a benefit on kidney function from renal artery stenting in atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Here are the first set of journal references. Second set of references are here. Discussion on Culprit Shock Clinical Trial Culprit Shock Trial investigated two strategies for percutaneous coronary interventions in acute myocardial infarction with cardiogenic shock. It was a multi-center randomized trial involving 706 participants who were randomized to either immediate PCI of the culprit lesion only with option for staged PCI of non-culprit lesions or immediate multivessel PCI. Primary composite endpoint included death and severe renal failure leading to renal replacement therapy within 30 days after randomization. Primary composite endpoint was lower in those who initially underwent culprit lesion only PCI. There was no difference in the time to hemodynamic stabilization, need and duration of catecholamine therapy, levels of troponin T and creatinine kinase, rates of bleeding and stroke between the two groups. All-cause mortality was 43% in the culprit lesion only PCA group while it was 51.6 in the multivessel PCA group. The rate of renal replacement therapy was similar in both groups 11.6% and 16.4% respectively. Higher dose of contrast needed for multivessel PCI is one possible reason for poor outcome in multivessel PCI but renal outcome was not significantly different in the two groups. Higher dose of contrast can also lead to acute left ventricular volume overload and consequent negative effect on myocardial function and recovery. Prolonged procedure in case of multivessel PCI in a hemodynamically compromised patient is another potential cause for poorer outcome. Based on culprit PCI trial results, 2018 ESC EACTS guidelines on myocardial revascularization downgraded immediate multivessel PCI in cardiogenic shock to class 3B recommendation. Class 3B means that the procedure is not useful and may be harmful based on the evidence from a single randomized trial. One year outcomes published later showed that mortality did not differ significantly between the two groups at one year of follow-up, but the rates of rehospitalization for heart failure and repeat revascularization were higher in the culprit lesion only PCA group than the multivessel PCA group at one year. The rates of rehospitalization for heart failure in both groups were low and the absolute difference between the groups was small. It is not sure whether this difference was due to mortality bias. Previous randomized trials for cardiogenic shock had shown that death was mostly confined to the first 30 days. Mortality between 30 days to 1 year was 6.6% in culprit shock trial. This compares well with other trials in cardiogenic shock. Corresponding mortality in shock trial was 6.6% and in IABP shock 2 trial it was 12.3%. Here are the first set of references. Second set of references are here.
Digoxin toxicity has become far less common as the use of digoxin, especially that of the loading dose, has come down. Still, an occasional case can occur due to renal dysfunction or drug interactions. Almost any type of arrhythmia can occur in digoxin toxicity except Mobitz type 2 second degree AV block and atrial fibrillation with a fast ventricular rate. On the contrary, a slow ventricular rate in atrial fibrillation could be a manifestation of digoxin toxicity. Ventricular ectopic beats in bigeminy is one of the commonest arrhythmias of digoxin toxicity. The most characteristic arrhythmia of digitoxicity is bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. This can occur even with digoxin levels in the normal range. Severe bradycardia can also be associated with digitoxicity. Hypokalemia which often occurs due to diuretic therapy which is given along with digoxin for treatment of heart failure potentiates the problem of digitoxicity. Correction of hypokalemia is important in the management of digoxin toxicity. But caution is needed when there is a slowed AV conduction due to digoxin as hyperkalemia decreases AV conduction further. Another precaution while correcting hypokalemia in digitoxicity is the renal status. Since digitoxicity may occur in the setting of renal insufficiency, hyperkalemia is a potential risk while correcting hypokalemia. When potassium levels are normal, magnesium levels could be the culprit in digoxin toxicity. Severe hypomagnesemia can precipitate digoxin induced cardiac arrhythmia with normal serum digoxin and potassium levels and respond to correction of hypomagnesemia. It is conventionally mentioned that the mirror image correction mark type of STT changes occur in digoxin effect in the leads corresponding to the dominant ventricle while the changes occur in other leads as well if there is digitoxicity. Digitoxicity often manifests with anorexia, nausea and vomiting. Sandopsia or yellow vision, an often mentioned manifestation of digoxin toxicity, is quite rare. Photophobia can also occur with digoxin toxicity. A case of severe digoxin toxicity with visual disturbances has been reported recently in a 91 year old female. There was decreased visual acuity and color vision along with other symptoms of digoxin toxicity. She had a 5 week hospital stay and visual symptoms took 2 months to resolve. Arrhythmias due to digoxin toxicity can be life threatening and difficult to manage. Direct current cardioversion in the presence of digitoxicity can lead on to more complex arrhythmias and ventricular fibrillation. FAB fragments of digoxin antibody if available is useful in the management of digoxin toxicity. Important drugs which can increase the levels of digoxin are Quinidine, Verapamil, Amiodron and Dronidaron. The dose of digoxin should be halved with concomitant use of Verapamil, Amiodron or Dronidaron. Monitoring of plasma digoxin levels and frequent evaluation for signs and symptoms of digoxin toxicity are recommended while using these drugs in combination with digoxin when that combination is deemed essential. First set of references on digoxin toxicity. Second set of references on digoxin toxicity. Discussion on discordant grading of severity of aortic stenosis or discordant AS. Discordance between various measures of severity of aortic stenosis is considered as discordant grading of severity of aortic stenosis or simply as discordant AS. Severe aortic stenosis has aortic Vmax more than or equal to 4 meters per second, mean gradient more than or equal to 40 millimeters of mercury, and effective orifice area less than or equal to 1 square centimeter. Peak aortic velocity and mean gradient are flow dependent measurements, while effective orifice area and Doppler velocity index are relatively flow independent. About 20 to 30 percent of patients may have discordant measures of severity of aortic stenosis on echocardiography. Discordance is mostly between effective orifice area and Vmax bar Doppler gradients. Low gradient and Vmax may occur with small effective orifice area. So the usual discordant AS has effective orifice area less than or equal to 1 square centimeter 
and mean gradient less than 40 millimeters of mercury. Low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis has low stroke volume with stroke volume index less than 35 ml per square meter body surface area. Low stroke volume index can occur with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction or with preserved ejection fraction. Lower stroke volume index is associated incrementally with mortality in low gradient severe aortic stenosis with preserved ejection fraction. Most frequent cause of low gradient aortic stenosis is a low left ventricular outflow state. This could be due to reduced left ventricular ejection which is the classical low flow low gradient aortic stenosis. When there is low flow with preserved ejection fraction, it is paradoxical low flow low gradient aortic stenosis. There is a third category of normal flow low gradient aortic stenosis with small aortic valve area as well. To differentiate between true severe aortic stenosis and pseudo severe aortic stenosis, two investigations are useful. Low dose diabetamine stress echocardiography is useful in classical low flow low gradient aortic stenosis with LV ejection fraction less than 50%. Aortic valve area increases as stroke volume increases with diabetamine in pseudo severe aortic stenosis. But it may not be useful unless the left ventricular stroke volume increases by 20% or more. Aortic valve calcium scoring and multi-detector computed tomography are useful in case of low flow low gradient and normal flow low gradient aortic stenosis. A calcium score above 2000 in males and 1250 in females suggests the presence of true severe aortic stenosis. In general, low flow low gradient severe aortic stenosis has worse outcome following aortic valve replacement compared to those with high gradient. Still, there is a survival benefit with AVR. There is also a suggestion that transcatheter aortic valve implantation may be superior to surgical AVR in this group. Patients with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis have higher late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac magnetic resonance imaging suggesting more myocardial fibrosis. This is in comparison with high gradient aortic stenosis. But this was found irrespective of the flow reserve documented by dobutamine stress echocardiography. While measuring left ventricular outflow tract for the continuity equation, measurement is better taken at the level of the aortic valve annulus rather than deeper into the LVOT. Velocity and gradient should be sampled from multiple windows like apical, right sternal border and suprasternal notch to avoid underestimation which can occur in up to 50% of cases. If the data are discordant even after these careful measurements, hybrid imaging may be considered to better define the LVOT cross-sectional area. These include three-dimensional echo and contrast enhanced computed tomography. Here are the first set of journal references for the topic. Second set of references are here. Doppler and tissue Doppler in left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. This is a tissue Doppler image with color kinesis in the inset. E by E prime of the medial mitral annulus is shown as 19.1 indicating left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. In diastolic dysfunction, as the relaxation of the LV is impaired, the velocity of medial mitral annulus is reduced so that E by E prime ratio is increased. E wave is measured prior to tissue Doppler imaging and stored so that the software application displays the E by E prime as soon as the E prime is measured. E by E prime below 8 is considered normal while ratio above 15 is considered a feature of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. E by E prime has been correlated with left atrial pressure as well, which is in fact the LV filling pressure which increases in LV diastolic dysfunction. There are also limitations for E by E prime in the assessment of LV diastolic dysfunction. These situations are decompensated advanced systolic heart failure with large LV, Broad QRS with abnormal septal motion, significant MR 
and presence of cardiac resynchronization therapy are all confounding factors. Though the E by E prime ratio is increased in this case, there is no E by A reversal which is the more commonly used indicator of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. When the E by A ratio is used, there could be several grades of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. First, the E by A ratio equalizes. Then there is reversal as the A wave becomes taller than the E wave. E wave is early diastolic and A wave occurs after atrial systole. In more severe diastolic dysfunction, as the left atrial pressure becomes very high, the E wave becomes much taller than the A wave with a sharp deceleration slope. This pattern is known as restrictive pattern. Here is a relevant journal reference. Discussion on echocardiographic assessment of patient prosthesis mismatch. Patient prosthesis mismatch is present when the effective prosthetic valve area is less than that of the normal human valve. The reduction in valve area is usually mild to moderate and may not be of immediate clinical significance. Occasionally it can be severe and patients may be hemodynamically and symptomatically worse after wall replacement. This typically occurs after aortic wall replacement for aortic stenosis as the aortic annulus is not dilated and permits insertion of only a smaller prosthetic wall compared to that in aortic regurgitation. Similar situation can be there after mitral wall replacement for mitral stenosis. Patient prosthesis mismatch is an important cause of increased transvalvar gradient detected by Doppler echocardiography. Effective orifice area of an aortic prosthetic wall may be too small in relation to patient's body surface area and can result in abnormally high gradients. Indexing of calculated valve area with respect to body surface area is usually done to assess patient prosthesis mismatch. Indexed effective orifice area of an aortic prosthetic valve should be more than 0.85 square centimeter per meter squared to avoid significant gradient at rest and exercise. This corresponds to the concept that in moderate stenosis of native aortic valve, the indexed effective orifice area is less than 0.9 square centimeter per meter squared. An indexed effective orifice area less than or equal to 0.6 square centimeter per meter squared will correspond to severe stenosis and requires reoperation. Effective orifice area is usually calculated using continuity equation and involves two dimensional and Doppler echocardiography. Effective prosthetic orifice area is equal to cross sectional area of the left ventricular outflow tract into velocity time integral of the left ventricular outflow divided by velocity time integral of aortic jet. The cross sectional area of left ventricular outflow tract can be calculated from the diameter measured by two dimensional echocardiography or the documented diameter of the sewing ring of prosthetic wall. A simplified method for calculation of effective orifice area is cross sectional area of left ventricular outflow tract into peak velocity of left ventricular outflow divided by peak velocity of aortic jet. In case of mitral wall replacement, an indexed effective orifice area less than 1.2 square centimeter per meter squared is considered as patient prosthesis mismatch. Mitral patient prosthesis mismatch has been classified as moderate if indexed effective orifice is more than 0.9 and less than or equal to 1.2 square centimeter per meter squared and severe if less than or equal to 0.9 square centimeter per meter squared. Circle tracking echocardiography has been used to assess patients with severe patient prosthesis mismatch. They defined severe patient prosthesis mismatch after aortic valve replacement as indexed effective orifice area of 0.65 square centimeter per meter squared or less. They found that global longitudinal strain and global circumferential strain was significantly decreased in the 54 patients with severe patient prosthesis mismatch 
suggesting subclinical left ventricular dysfunction. These patients had preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. Three dimensional and transesophageal echocardiography can be used to get better measurements of the left ventricular outflow tract diameter compared to transthoracic echocardiography. Outer margin of the stent or cage of the prosthetic wall should be measured. While assessing transprosthetic velocity by continuous wave Doppler, multiple windows including epical and right parasternal views should be used. For measurement of left ventricular outflow velocity, pulse wave Doppler sample should be placed immediately below the epical border of the stent with no wall opening or closing clicks visible. First set of journal references on patient prosthesis mismatch are here. Second set of journal references on echocardiographic assessment of patient prosthesis mismatch are here. These are the third set of references. Discussion on fetal and transitional circulation. Fetal circulation is different from adult circulation. Changes occurring soon after birth constitutes transitional circulation. Respiratory gas exchange in the fetus occurs in the placenta rather than the lungs. Fetal cardiovascular system is designed so that most saturated blood reaches the heart and the brain. Fetal circulation can be called a shunt dependent circulation because there are intracardiac and extracardiac shunts. Cardiac output in the fetus is called combined ventricular output. Despite the low oxygen partial pressures in fetal blood, presence of fetal hemoglobin and high combined ventricular output helps in the oxygen delivery to the tissues. Fetal blood returns to the placenta by the umbilical arteries and returns back to the fetus by the umbilical vein. More than half of this bypasses the hepatic circulation through the ductus venosus and reaches the inferior vena cava. Streaming of blood from the ductus venosus with saturation of 80 to 90 percent is separate from the desaturated blood returning from the lower part of the body. Eustachian valve at the junction of the inferior vena cava and the right atrium directs this saturated blood to the foramen oil and into the left atrium. Left atrial oxygen saturation is about 65 percent in the fetus. This saturated blood passes into the left ventricle and is ejected into the aorta. Major part of this blood reaches the cerebral and coronary circulation. Desaturated blood from the superior vena cava, coronary sinus and the remaining part of the inferior vena cava stream is directed across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Only around 12% of the blood ejected from the right ventricle reaches the lung due to high fetal pulmonary vascular resistance. Rest of it crosses the ductus arteriosus and reaches descending aorta. So lower body gets relatively desaturated blood. Part of it goes to the placenta through the umbilical arteries for oxygenation. In the fetus, 65% of venous return reaches the right ventricle and 35% reaches the left ventricle due to the shunts. About 45% of the combined ventricular output is delivered to the placenta while the lung receives only 8%. Soon after birth, lung expands and lung liquid is cleared. This leads to a marked fall in pulmonary vascular resistance and increase in pulmonary blood flow. The fetal right ventricular dominance changes to the left ventricular dominance over a period of time as the right ventricular mass regresses and left ventricular muscle mass increases to support the systemic vascular resistance. Increase in pulmonary venous return raises left atrial pressure and the valvula foramen oval closes. Ductus arteriosus starts constricting on exposure to the high oxygen saturation in blood after birth. Ductus venosus also gets obliterated. Transitional circulation is relevant in congenital heart diseases. The closure of ductus arteriosus in the early neonatal period can lead to marked fall in the oxygen saturation in cyanotic congenital heart disease with low pulmonary blood flow. Maintaining ductal patency with prostaglandin infusion or ductal stenting 
is often resorted to as a bailout procedure in such situations. There is a similar role for maintaining ductal patency in ductus dependent systemic circulation as well. Similarly, a restrictive foramen oil leads to desaturation in transposition of great arteries. Here comes the role of neonatal balloon atrial septostomy in dextrotransposition of great arteries. In case of atrial septal defect, significant left to right shunt is usually not established soon after birth. Maximum shunting occurs when the right ventricular mass regresses and right ventricular compliance increases. That is why the clinical diagnosis of atrial septal defect is often delayed beyond early infancy. Even with ventricular septal defect and patent ductus arteriosus, the full establishment of the left to right shunt is delayed a few weeks, awaiting the regression of pulmonary vascular resistance. That is why these lesions may not be picked up clinically soon after birth and needs follow-up evaluation so that they are not missed. Closure of both ductus arteriosus and ductus venosus is delayed in preterm infants. Prevalence of patent ductus arteriosus increases with increasing prematurity. It is said that the premature ductus responds poorly to oxygen and more to prostaglandin. Clamping of the umbilical cord after delivery leads to a 30 to 50 percent decrease in venous return. Discussion on Fontan Circulation Fontan repair of tricuspid atresia was initiated in late 1960s. Francis Fontan and associates reported that surgical repair was carried out in three patients with tricuspid atresia, of which two were successful. Inferior vena cava blood was directed to the left lung and right pulmonary artery received the superior vena cava blood through a cavopulmonary anastomosis. They mentioned that the size of the pulmonary arteries must be large enough and at sufficiently low pressure to allow flow in a cavopulmonary anastomosis. The first step was a gland procedure in which distal end of right pulmonary artery was anastomosed to the superior vena cava. Proximal end of the right pulmonary artery was then anastomosed to the right atrium so that after closure of the atrial septal defect, inferior vena cava blood is directed to the left pulmonary artery. The main pulmonary artery was ligated at its exit from the hypoplastic right ventricle. Two aortic or pulmonary valve homographs were used to propel inferior vena cava blood to the left lung. One was at the junction of inferior vena cava and right atrium to prevent backflow of blood during atrial systole. The other was at the anastomosis of right atrial appendage to the proximal end of right pulmonary artery to prevent reflux from left pulmonary artery to right atrium during diastole. Various modifications for fondant procedure have since been introduced. Total cavo pulmonary connection by Mark Telewal was published in 1988. The procedure consisted of three parts end to side anastomosis of superior vena cava to the undivided right pulmonary artery, creation of a composite intraatrial tunnel using the posterior wall of the right atrium and a prosthetic patch to channel inferior vena cava blood to the enlarged orifice of the transected superior vena cava that is anastomosed to the main pulmonary artery. Other variations of the procedure have used intracardiac and extracardiac continue. Indications were expanded to include right or left atrioventricular wall atresia, abnormalities of pulmonary venous connection and even hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Operative and short term mortality of these patients were more than most other surgeries for congenital heart disease and hence careful patient selection was needed while planning to create a fondant circulation. The concept of two-stage repair, initial hemifondant in which superior vena cava was anastomosed with a branch pulmonary artery, followed a few months later by completion fondant 
connecting inferior vena cava to branch pulmonary arteries was introduced by Norwood and colleagues. Long term follow up after Fondan operation has been published from Mayo Clinic. They reviewed the outcome of all patients who had undergone modified Fondan operation between 1973 and 2012. 10 year survival for the 1052 patients in the database was 74%. 20-year survival was 61% and 30-year survival 43%. Factors associated with decreased survival were preoperative diuretic use, longer cardiopulmonary bypass time, surgery prior to 1991, atrioventricular wall replacement at the time of fondant procedure, elevated post bypass fondant or left atrial pressures, Prolonged chest tube drainage beyond 21 days, post-operative arrhythmias, renal insufficiency, and development of protein-losing enteropathy. Sinus rhythm was associated with improved survival. Most common re-operations were pacemaker insertion or revision, fondant revision or conversion, and atrioventricular wall replacement. Clinically significant late arrhythmias occurred in 44%. Protein losing enteropathy developed in 9% of patients. Protein losing enteropathy markedly reduced survival. 10 year survival came down to 35% and 20 year survival to just 19%. 20 year survival of 84% after modified fondant procedure has been reported in another series of 305 patients operated between 1980 and 2000. They noted better survival with improved techniques. 15 year survival was 81% after atriopulmonary connection versus 94% for lateral tunnel. Fondant circulation is basically a single ventricle heart with the dominant ventricle supporting the systemic circulation and passive flow into the pulmonary circulation through cavo-pulmonary connection. Heart failure was the mode of death in 34% in a series of 600 adult fondant survivors. Arrhythmia or sudden death was the reason in 24%. Atrioventricular wall regurgitation is often associated with ventricular failure and it can be progressive. Pleural effusion, chylothorax and plastic bronchitis are important pulmonary complications associated with fontan circulation. Predisposition to thrombosis and thromboembolism are also well known. It contributed to 7.9% of the late deaths in one study. Review of Griffon study on Selexipac for pulmonary hypertension. Selexipac is an orally active IP prostacycline receptor agonist. It is structurally different from prostacycline. Griffon was a phase 3 double blind randomized placebo controlled trial which randomized 1156 patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Patients included those who are not on treatment for pulmonary arterial hypertension and those on stable dose of endothelin receptor antagonist, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor or both. 181 centers from 39 countries participated in the Griffon study. Primary endpoint was a composite of death from any cause or complication related to pulmonary hypertension up to the end of the treatment which was defined as 7 days after last intake of trial medication. Primary endpoint event occurred in 41.6% of the placebo group and 27% of the Selexipac group. 81.9% of the events were due to disease progression and hospitalization. Effect of Selexipac was similar in those receiving baseline treatment and in those who were not receiving baseline treatment. Mortality was 105 in the placebo group and 100 in the Selexipac group. 
the difference in mortality was not statistically significant. 18.9% of the patients had discontinued study medication prematurely, but sensitivity analysis had shown that this did not affect the final conclusions. Subjective elements in the primary endpoints was another limitation of the study. Adjudication by a three-person critical event committee was sought to reduce the bias from this aspect. The endpoints were decided based on the recommendations of the task force on endpoints and clinical trial design at the 4th World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension 2008. 80% of the patients in the Griffon study were already receiving therapy for pulmonary hypertension at baseline. 33% of the enrolled patients were receiving two pulmonary arterial hypertension therapies at baseline. A remarkable feature of the Griffon study was that it was able to enroll a large number of patients from a large number of centers spread over 39 countries. The vast majority of patients were in WHO functional class 2 and 3. The study has shown that Celexic PAG can be used either as a single agent or in combination with endothelin receptor antagonist and or phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Here are a couple of journal references. Discussion on Innocent Heart Murmurs Murmurs without any organic heart disease can be found in children. These have been called by various names like Innocent Murmur, Physiological Murmur, Normal Murmur and even Functional Murmur. But the term innocent murmur is preferred as it strongly conveys that nothing is abnormal. Less than 1% of murmurs in children are due to congenital heart disease. Classical flow murmurs heard in children are stills murmur, pulmonary flow murmurs, systemic flow murmurs like supraclavicular systemic bruit and venous hum. Stills murmur was first described by George Frederick Still in 1909. This is a low-pitched murmur heard in the lower left sternal area. It is best heard with the bell of the stethoscope. As it is flow related, it can change with position and decrease or disappear with Valsalva maneuver. McCusick and colleagues described it as a musical murmur. Stills murmur is a mid-systolic murmur, loudest in supine position and diminishes in intensity on sitting up and standing as venous return decreases. Pulmonary flow murmurs are high-pitched murmurs heard in upper left sternal border. They are better heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. They are also flow dependent and will change with position and may decrease or disappear with Valsalva maneuver. When the blood flow velocity increases as in fever or anemia, it becomes more prominent. Systemic flow murmurs and supraclavicular bruit are high-pitched murmurs due to normal blood flow into the aorta and head and neck vessels. They are heard high up in the chest and above the clavicles. Being high-pitched, they are better heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. The murmur is better heard in the supine position and diminishes in intensity when the neck is hyperextended. Venous hums are low-pitched continuous murmurs due to the blood flow in the great veins. They are heard best with the bell of the stethoscope. Cervical venous hum can be completely obliterated by pressure over the major neck veins. It also changes with position and is better in the sitting position than in the supine position due to the effect of gravity. Looking down or the side may also make cervical venous hum inaudible. These maneuvers are helpful in differentiating it from the continuous murmur of patent ductus arteriosus. Murmur of patent ductus arteriosus may be associated with multiple clicks known as eddy sounds which gives the murmur the famous train in tunnel character. An interesting study on computer aided auscultation involving 126 children in the age group 0 to 17 years has been published. The technique showed 83% sensitivity for detection of potentially pathological murmur at a specificity of 30.3%. When the analysis was limited to subjects with a heart rate between 15 to 120 beats per minute, the sensitivity was 75% and specificity 71.4%. Here are some relevant journal references.
Discussion on Ischemia Trial and Ischemia CKD Trial Ischemia Trial funded by National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute and others randomized 5,179 patients with moderate or severe ischemia to an initial invasive strategy or an initial conservative strategy. Initial invasive strategy was angiography and revascularization when feasible. Initial conservative therapy was of medical treatment alone and angiography if medical therapy failed. Primary composite outcome included death from cardiovascular causes, myocardial infarction or hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure or resuscitated cardiac arrest. 318 primary outcome events in the invasive strategy group and 352 primary outcome events in the conservative strategy group occurred over a median follow-up period of 3.2 years. Cumulative event rates at 6 months were 5.3% and 3.4% in the two groups. At 5 years, the cumulative event rates were 16.4% in the invasive group and 18.2% in the conservative group. 145 deaths occurred in the invasive strategy group and 144 deaths in the conservative strategy group. Authors concluded that among patients with stable coronary artery disease and moderate or severe ischemia, there was no evidence that early invasive strategy reduced the risk of ischemic cardiovascular events or all-cause mortality over the study period. Enrollment in the study was after clinically indicated stress testing showed moderate or severe reversible ischemia on imaging test or severe ischemia on exercise testing without imaging. Computed tomographic angiography was done in most patients to exclude left main coronary artery disease and non-obstructive coronary disease. More procedure related infarctions and lesser non-procedural infarctions on follow-up were noted in the invasive strategy group. Though ischemia trials showed equivalence of invasive and non-invasive strategies, the findings do not apply to patients with acute coronary syndromes, significant left main coronary artery disease, low ejection fraction, class 3 or 4 heart failure, or those who are very symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy. Angina-related health status of the ischemia trial patients was reported in another paper. Seattle Angina Questionnaire was used to assess angina-related symptoms, function, and quality of life. Assessments were done at randomization 1.5 months, 3 months, 6 months, and thereafter every 6 months. 35% of patients did not have angina in the previous month at baseline assessment. Patients assigned to invasive strategy had greater improvement in angina-related health status. As expected, differences were minimal among asymptomatic patients and large among those with angina at baseline. Another related study was the Ischemia CKD trial which randomized 777 patients with advanced kidney disease and moderate or severe ischemia on stress testing. Usually, patients with advanced kidney disease are excluded from clinical trials assessing revascularization in patients with stable coronary artery disease. A composite of death or non-fatal myocardial infarction was the primary outcome measured. 123 patients in the invasive strategy group and 129 patients in the conservative strategy group had a primary outcome event at a median follow-up of 2.2 years. Higher incidence of stroke and higher incidence of death or initiation of dialysis was noted in the invasive strategy group. Authors concluded that early invasive strategy did not reduce death or non-fatal myocardial infarction among patients with stable coronary artery disease, advanced chronic kidney disease, and moderate or severe ischemia. Similar negative results were documented earlier by Courage trial 
at both initial 4.6 years median follow-up and an extended follow-up period up to 15 years for early invasive strategy in chronic coronary syndrome. Discussion on long QT syndromes including the genetic types. Long QT syndromes are a group of inherited arrhythmogenic disorders characterized by prolonged QT interval and life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. Prevalence of long QT syndrome varies from 1 in 5000 to 10,000 in various regions. 16 genotypes LQT1 to LQT16 have been described as per the OMIM database. The initially described syndromes were an autosomal dominant Romanovart syndrome and the autosomal recessive jewell lange nielsen syndrome. Now it is known that both are two ends of a spectrum with homozygous individuals having deafness due to defective endolymph secretion in the middle ear which is mediated by potassium channels. Most common varieties of LQTS are LQT1, LQT2 and LQT3. LQT1 contributes about 50%, LQT2 about 35 to 40%, and LQT3 10 to 15%. The other varieties are quite rare with only few families being described. LQT1 is due to defect in the gene encoding for alpha subunit of the potassium channel conducting the slow component of the delayed rectifier current. Delayed rectifier current is the major repolarizing current during phase 3 of the cardiac action potential. Defect in the beta subunit leads to LQT5. A functional channel will be constituted by a tetramer of KV LQT1 and an MINK. The gene for LQT1 is KCNQ1 and in those who are homozygous for it, JLN1 is manifested. The gene for LQT5 is KCNE1 and JLN2 manifests when it is homozygous. Just as LQT1 and LQT5 are related to the same channel, LQT2 and LQT6 are related to the rapid component of the delayed rectifier current. KCNH2 encodes for the alpha subunit and KCNE2 encodes for the beta subunit. LQT2 is more severe and has a higher penetrance than LQT1 and females are more affected than males while it is the other way around in LQT1. While LQT2 events are precipitated by sudden arousal, LQT1 events are related to exercise. LQT3 is different from the other varieties as it is mediated by the sodium channel. The channel protein is called NAV 1.5. While the previously discussed varieties are due to loss of function of the channel, LQT3 is due to gain of function of the sodium channel. The allelic disorder in which there is a loss of function of sodium channels is Brugada syndrome, another important arrhythmogenic disorder prone for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. While LQT1 and LQT2 are related to sympathetic states, the arrhythmias in LQT3 occur during rest or sleep. Hence, beta blockers, the sheet anger of therapy in other varieties is less effective. LQT4 is unique in that it is not due to a defect in a cardiac ion channel but due to a defect in anchoring proteins which anchor the ion channels to the plasma membrane or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It is due to mutation in anchorin B gene ANG2 and LQT4 is characterized by severe sinus bradycardia and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in addition to a long QT interval. LQT7 or Anderson syndrome is also due to a defect in potassium channel but has additional features of hypokalemic periodic paralysis and dysmorphic features. KCNJ2 encoding for the inwardly rectifier potassium channel CRT 2.1, the ion channel conducting IK1 current is the culprit in Anderson syndrome. LQT8 is also called Timothy syndrome and is due to a defect in the calcium channel CACNA1C.
Timothy syndrome is also associated with other features like congenital heart disease, patent ductus arteriosus, ventricular septal defect, tetralogy of fallow, and dysmorphic facial features like flat nasal bridge, low set ears, and deformed teeth. LQT9 is due to a defect in caveolin 3 and has been associated with sudden infant death syndrome. LQT10 is another disorder of sodium channel SCNB4 with the gene located on chromosome 11. It is also associated with familial atrial fibrillation 17. LQT11 is caused by heterozygous mutation in the gene encoding A kinase anger protein 9 on chromosome 7. LQT12 is caused by a mutation in the gene encoding alpha 1 syndrophin on chromosome 20. LQT13 is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern and the genetic defect was mapped to chromosome 11 and the candidate gene was KCNJ5. LQT14 is caused by heterozygous mutation in the CALM1 gene on chromosome 14. LQT15 is caused by heterozygous mutation in the CAM2 gene on chromosome 2. LQT16 and catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia 6 are caused by heterozygous mutation in the CAM3 gene on chromosome 19. Long QT syndromes have common phenotype of delayed depolarization caused by ion channel mutations which in turn causes QT prolongation and a propensity for ventricular tachyarrhythmias. These arrhythmias can cause hypotension and syncope and sometimes sudden cardiac death. Clinical features, age at onset, family history, ECG and finally genetic testing are the important steps in the evaluation of a suspected long QT syndrome. Over the years, increased awareness and improved genetic testing has caused an increase in the number of diagnosed cases of long QT syndrome though the true prevalence may not have increased. But the variability in ECG is striking with about one third of the mutation positive LQTS carriers having a QT interval which overlaps with that of healthy normal individuals. Moreover, various factors like age, central nervous system disorders, changes in electrolytes and several medications can affect the QT interval. There is a lot of variation in the symptoms as well, with even one third of the LQTS mutations in certain families never having any symptom. Different subtypes have different risks for cardiac events and clinical signs and symptoms do not adequately differentiate the LQTS subtype, though the symptom triggers may have an indication. Similarly, the response to beta blockers may also vary depending on the subtype. For example, LQT3 does not respond well to beta blockers, but it responds to sodium channel blockers. The term concealed long QT syndrome is used to indicate individuals with genotype of long QT syndrome and a phenotype with normal QT interval. They are usually detected on family screening of those with manifest long QT syndrome. Goldenberg and colleagues noted that among 3,386 genotyped subjects from seven multinational LQTS registries, 469 had concealed long QT syndrome and 1,392 had prolonged QT intervals. In that report, 1,525 were unaffected family members. The risk of sudden cardiac death or aborted cardiac arrest was 10 times higher in those with concealed LQTS than the unaffected family members. This is notwithstanding the finding that those with manifest LQTS had a much higher risk of sudden cardiac death or aborted cardiac arrest of 15%. In concealed LQTS, the risk of sudden cardiac death or aborted cardiac arrest was higher in those with LQT1 and LQT3 genotypes than in LQT2 genotype. But unlike in manifest LQTS, females were not shown to be at a higher risk in concealed LQTS. Implantable defibrillators are often needed in LQTS 
symptomatic on maximally tolerated doses of beta blockers for prevention of sudden cardiac death. Certain varieties associated with bradycardia in childhood may benefit from pacemaker implantation. Here is the first set of references on long QT syndromes. Second set of references on long QT syndromes. Third set of references are here. Discussion on low gradient severe mitral stenosis. Usually mitral stenosis is associated with high transmitral gradient. Low gradient severe mitral stenosis has been defined as mean transmitral gradient less than 10 mm of mercury in patients with mitral valve area less than or equal to 1.5 square centimeter. A low flow subgroup has been defined with left ventricular stroke volume index less than or equal to 35 ml per meter squared. In a study of 101 patients with severe rheumatic metal stenosis who underwent balloon valvuloplasty, low gradient was present in 55 patients and low flow low gradient in 11 patients. Low flow low gradient mitral stenosis patients were older, had higher rates of atrial fibrillation, arterial afterload, subvalvar thickening and decreased left ventricular compliance compared to high gradient mitral stenosis. 40% of those with low gradient mitral stenosis did not have symptomatic benefit compared to 18% with high gradient after valvuloplasty. European Association of Echocardiography and American Society of Echocardiography recommendation in 2009 had defined severe mitral stenosis as valve area less than 1 square centimeter. 2014 AHA ACC guideline defines severe mitral stenosis as valve area less than or equal to 1.5 square centimeter. An earlier study of 180 patients who underwent percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty found 36 patients with transmetal gradient less than or equal to 10 mm of mercury. 24 of these 36 patients had reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Those with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction were noted to have left ventricular wall motion abnormalities on ventriculography. Balloon valvuloplasty did not significantly improve symptoms in those who had pre-procedure left ventricular ejection fraction less than or equal to 35%. A similar study in patients undergoing mitral wall replacement for very severe mitral stenosis has been done by Cho and Associates. Among 140 patients who underwent mitral valve replacement for pure valvular mitral stenosis with valve area less than or equal to 1 square centimeter by planimetry, low gradient of less than 10 mm of mercury was noted in 82 patients. Low gradient patients were older and more likely to have diabetes mellitus, atrial fibrillation and female gender. Their left atrial volume index was larger and left ventricular strain during isovolumic relaxation was lower. Percentage reduction of left atrial volume index after mitral wall replacement was also smaller. Even though preoperative functional class was similar, persistent symptoms after mitral wall replacement were more common in the low gradient group. Here are the first set of journal references on low gradient severe mitral stenosis. Second set of references are here. Myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries or MINOCA had a prevalence of 6% among myocardial infarctions noted in a recent systematic review. They are more likely to be younger and female but less often have dyslipidemia as a risk factor. Other risk factors were found to be similar. Total mortality at one year with MINOCA is about 4.7% compared to 6.7% with myocardial infarction associated with obstructive coronary artery disease. Typical myocardial infarction as demonstrated by cardiac magnetic resonance imaging was noted only in about a quarter of cases. One third had myocarditis while about one fourth of cases had no significant abnormality on CMR. Inducible coronary spasm occurred in about a quarter of the cases and 
thrombophilia was noted in 14%. For diagnosing minoca, criteria as per universal definition of myocardial infarction should be satisfied along with absence of significant coronary stenosis that is 50% or more. There should be no overt cause for the clinical presentation like Takoshubo cardiomyopathy. An observational study of Minoka took patients from the sweat heart registry of the 199,162 myocardial infarction admission screened. They found 9,466 patients with Minoka. They evaluated the 9,136 patients who survived 30 days after discharge to assess the role of medical therapy for secondary prevention. They found long-term benefits with statins, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers. There was a trend towards positive effect with beta blockers, while dual antiplatelet therapy had a neutral effect. These are the first set of references on Minoka. Remaining references on Minoka are here. Discussion on Multimodality Imaging for Assessment of Myocardial Viability Myocardial Viability Assessment is important prior to decision on revascularization. The term Viable Myocardium is applied to myocardium with a potentially reversible contractile dysfunction in patients with coronary artery disease. It can be divided into stunned myocardium and hibernating myocardium. Stunned myocardium has prolonged contractile dysfunction after a transient ischemic episode and coronary reperfusion. This automatically recovers over a period of time. Stunned myocardium is commonly noted after thrombolysis and primary percutaneous coronary intervention. Hibernating myocardium has reduced contractile function due to persistently impaired coronary blood flow. Hibernating myocardium regains contractile function partially or completely after revascularization. The goal of myocardial viability assessment is to identify those patients who will improve with coronary revascularization. It is useful to triage those with heart failure into ones which require revascularization versus those who require left ventricular assist devices or cardiac transplantation. It can predict the recovery of myocardial function with treatment and thus the prognosis. Assessment of myocardial contractile reserve can be done by echocardiography and other imaging modalities. Segmental thickening and systolic function can be assessed by echo and MRI. Myocardial perfusion can be assessed by single photon emission computer tomography and myocardial contrast echocardiography. Metabolism of myocardial cells are assessed by positron emission tomography. Myocardial scar can be detected by CMR seen as late gadolinium enhancement or LGE and by multi-detector computed tomography. Myocardial viability assessment by echocardiography. Diastolic wall thickness will give an idea regarding the myocardial viability. Thin and hyperdense myocardium is likely to be scarred and non-viable. Dobutamine stress echocardiography documents the contractile reserve of the myocardium and hence indicates viability. Myocardial perfusion is assessed by myocardial contrast echocardiography. Strain and strain rate imaging is done by tissue Doppler and speckle tracking. There are various methods of assessing diastolic function using Doppler and tissue Doppler echocardiography. And diastolic wall thickness is one of the simplest methods to screen for myocardial viability which cardiac surgeons check most often. And diastolic wall thickness more than 5.5 mm has a sensitivity of 94%, albeit with a low specificity of 48% for detection of myocardial viability. With end diastolic wall thickness less than 5 to 6 mm, less than 5% will be viable, while with thickness above that, viability is more than 50%. Pharmacological stress echocardiography can be done using dobutamine, adenosine, or dipredamol. Low dose dobutamine echocardiography is useful in assessing myocardial contractile reserve. Parasternal and apical windows can be used to assess the response in 16 to 17 myocardial segments. Higher doses of dobutamine can be used to check whether there is any biphasic response indicating ischemic viable myocardium.
the response to dobutamine can be divided into four types. In monophysic or sustained response, low dose dobutamine increases the contraction which is further enhanced in high dose. In biphasic response, low dose enhances contraction while high doses decrease the contraction. Another type is ischemic response in which both low dose and high dose produces decrease in contraction. In non-phasic response, there is hardly any contraction of the segment throughout. Roughly 40% will have a non-phasic response while nearly one third can have a biphasic response. Sustained response may be noted in nearly one fifth and worsening may be noted in 15%. Biphasic response had the highest predictive value for recovery of function after coronary angioplasty. Non-phasic and monophasic responses predicted poor recovery of function while ischemic response was in between. Dobutamine stress echocardiography has been noted to have better specificity than nuclear imaging. DSC has a fair value in prognostication as well. Echo-based techniques for assessment of myocardial viability has certain advantages as well as limitations. Echocardiographic techniques are safe and do not have the risk of ionizing radiation like nuclear perfusion studies and positron emission tomography. Due to portability of echocardiographic equipment, even bedside evaluation is possible and the equipment are widely available. Cost of procedure is much less compared to nuclear imaging studies. Unlike cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, presence of pacemakers and defibrillators are not a problem. Other coexisting cardiac pathology can also be assessed by echocardiography and there is a good relation between echocardiographic findings and outcome of revascularization. Both image acquisition and interpretation of images are operator dependent and there could be significant interoperator variability. Spatial resolution of echocardiography is relatively low compared to other techniques. Poor echo window like those in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease can affect the diagnostic accuracy significantly. There is a tendency to underestimate viability leading to a lower sensitivity for echo based techniques. Myocardial contrast echocardiography has been used in the assessment of myocardial viability. Downside of myocardial contrast echocardiography is the cost of ultrasound contrast agent. Intravenous administration of contrast improves the visualization of myocardial segments and enables the assessment of perfusion. Myocardial segments with normal perfusion and those with patchy perfusion are considered to be viable. Those segments which have no perfusion are taken as non-viable myocardial segments. Ultrasonic contrast agent consists of ultrasonic micro bubbles. A study compared myocardial contrast echo with gated single photon emission computer tomography for detection of significant coronary artery disease. The study had enrolled 628 patients with more than one cardiovascular risk factors in 99%. 516 patients underwent myocardial contrast echocardiography, technician 99M labeled ECG gated SPECT and quantitative coronary angiography. About one third had coronary stenosis of 70% or more, 131 had single vessel disease and 30 had multi vessel disease. 310 had coronary stenosis of 50% or more. They documented higher sensitivity for myocardial contrast echocardiography than SPECT though with lower specificity. An accompanying editorial was slightly skeptical about the role of myocardial contrast echocardiography. They mentioned that the study missed one of its primary endpoints in the form of non-inferiority of specificity for detection of 70% or more coronary stenosis. Myocardial strain is a measure of deformation of a myocardial segment relative to its length. Strain rate is the rate at which the deformation occurs. This is in effect the gradient between velocities at two points. Strain and strain rate can be measured echocardiographically using tissue Doppler and two-dimensional speckle tracking. A change of radial myocardial strain of more than 
has been shown to have a sensitivity of 83.9% and a specificity of 81.4% for detection of myocardial viability. Change in longitudinal myocardial strain more than 14.6% had a sensitivity of 86.7% and specificity of 90.2% for detection of myocardial viability. Low dose dobutamine infusion at 10 microgram per kg per minute along with strain rate assessment is useful to assess myocardial viability. Increase in peak systolic strain rate of more than minus 0.23 per second gave a sensitivity of 83% and specificity of 84% compared with FDG PET as gold standard for detection of myocardial viability. Thus, increase in peak systolic strain rate during low dose dobutamine infusion permits discrimination between viable and non-viable myocardial segments. Cardiac magnetic resonance imaging can be used to assess myocardial viability. Preserved myocardial wall thickness of more than 5.5 mm has a good sensitivity of 95% but low specificity for detecting myocardial viability on CMR. Delayed or late gadolinium enhancement on CMR indicates myocardial scar. If the extent of scar is less as indicated by less than 50% transmural extent of hyperenhancement, it indicates viability. If four or more dysfunctional segments show viability, it has a good sensitivity of 95%, again with low specificity of 45%. Dobutamine Cine MRI is useful in assessing the contractile reserve of the myocardium. Improvement in myocardial thickening of more than 2 mm with low dose dobutamine CMR is indicative of viability. CMR has the advantage of an accurate assessment of the extent of myocardial scar with superior spatial resolution. Wall thickness can be accurately measured by CMR. The image quality is not limited by characteristics of patient chest wall as in echocardiography. There is good inter-observer and intra-observer agreement in the assessment of LGE. CMR has good sensitivity and a fair specificity. Some of the limitations of CMR are its high cost, limited availability, longer imaging time and restrictions in patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices. Claustrophobia of patients may sometimes prevent CMR imaging. Gadolinium enhancement is not suitable in those with low glomerular filtration rate of below 30 ml per minute. Irregular heart rhythms make gating difficult. Sick patients may find breath holding difficult. While performing dobutamine stress, there are technical difficulties in monitoring the patient in the MRI suit. Multi-slice computer tomography can be used for assessing myocardial viability. Iodinated contrast used for CT scanning accumulate in infarcted myocardium similar to what happens with late gadolinium enhanced MRI. With the high spatial resolution inherent to MDCT, differentiation of transmural and subendocardial infarction is possible. Old infarcts have lower density on CT compared to recent infarcts. In general, there is good agreement between LGE MRI and late enhancement noted on MDCT. In a comparison with dobutamine stress echocardiography, MDCT with 64 slice CT findings agreed with stress echo findings in 97.3% of the myocardial segments analyzed. Disagreement was noted only in 2.7% of the segments. Overall, MDCT has not become as popular as echo, CMR, Technician 99M system AB and PET for the assessment of myocardial viability. MDCT has higher radiation exposure than other modalities and it does have a potential risk of contrast induced acute kidney injury. Rest and nitroglycerin myocardial viability scan. Rest images were obtained after intravenous administration of 8 millicurie of 99M technetium. 25 millicurie of 99M technetium was injected hours later and after 0.5 mg of sublingual nitroglycerin and rust gated images obtained. Exercise was deferred in view of clinical background of triple vessel disease and severe left ventricular dysfunction.
Rust images showed a moderately dilated left ventricle and no pulmonary uptake of tracer. Perfusion abnormality was noted in the inferior wall and infralateral segments. There was some improvement of perfusion with nitroglycerin. Gated single photon emission computer tomography analysis showed global hypokinesia with a global ejection fraction of about 23%. Positron emission tomography is usually taken as the gold standard for assessment of myocardial viability. PET scan with 13 ammonia gives the perfusion while 18 FDG shows the metabolic activity of the myocardium. A mismatch between perfusion and metabolism whereby underperfused region of myocardium is shown to have active metabolism is an indicator of myocardial viability. Important advantages of PET are that validity is well established and it has an excellent sensitivity. PET can be done in patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices while CMR is not suitable in that situation. Compared to single photon emission computer tomography, PET has a better spatial and temporal resolution with better quality of pictures and less radiation risk. The most important limitation of PET is its high cost and limited availability. It has some radiation risk when compared to echocardiography and cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. Here are the first set of references on myocardial viability assessment. Second set of references are here. These are the third set of references. Discussion on left ventricular non-compaction. Non-compaction of the left ventricle is often classified as a cardiomyopathy and is characterized by abnormal deep trabeculations which is more at the apex. Left ventricular non-compaction can be associated with left ventricular dilatation or hypertrophy. Systolic and diastolic dysfunction can occur and other congenital heart diseases can be associated. Ventricular arrhythmias and complete atrioventricular block can occur and present as syncope or sudden cardiac death. Genetic transmission has been noted in 30 to 50 percent of patients and several genes have been implicated. Notch signaling pathway seems to be the final common pathway affected. It was thought that embryological arrest of normal endomyocardial morphogenesis was the cause of non-compaction, but some authors have disputed this theory. In the early stages of development of the heart, when the coronary circulation is yet to develop, thin trabeculae prevent ischemia by providing good surface area for direct absorption from the blood in the cavity. Initially, trabecular growth is rapid and accounts for most of the ventricular mass. Later on, the trabecular growth becomes slower compared to the compact ventricular wall. A systematic review and meta-analysis of observational studies found 28 eligible studies enrolling 2,501 patients with left ventricular non-compaction. Cardiovascular mortality was 1.92 per 100 person years at a median follow-up of 2.9 years in the meta-analysis. The risk was similar to that of dilated cardiomyopathy. Risks of thromboembolism and ventricular arrhythmias in left ventricular non-compaction were similar to dilated cardiomyopathy. But the incidence of heart failure hospitalizations was higher than in dilated cardiomyopathy. Left ventricular ejection fraction and not the extent of trabeculation appeared to be an important determinant of adverse outcome in non-compaction of the left ventricle. Another study of 339 adults identified between 2000 and 2016 assessed the long-term survival. Three imaging criteria used for defining left ventricular non-compaction were Jenny criteria, Chin criteria and Peterson criteria. Jenny criteria for left ventricular non-compaction was and systolic non-compacted to compacted myocardial ratio more than 2. Chin criteria was the end diastolic ratio between the troughs and the peaks of trabeculation to epicardium less than 0.5. These two were echocardiographic criteria.
Peterson criteria was ratio of n diastolic non compacted to compacted myocardium more than 2.3 on magnetic resonance imaging. Median age was 47.4 years and 59 patients died during a median follow up of 6.3 years. 57% of patients had left ventricular ejection fraction below 50%. Isolated epical non compaction was noted in 48%. Age left ventricular ejection fraction below 50% and non compaction extending from apex to mid or basal segments were the factors associated with all cause mortality on multivariable Cox regression analysis. An interesting finding in this study from Mayo Clinic was that those with isolated epical non compaction and normal left ventricular ejection fraction had survival comparable to general population. Treatment of left ventricular non compaction follow the same lines as those with heart failure due to dilated cardiomyopathy with diuretics, beta blockers, angiotensin converting enzyme blockers and other afterload reducing agents. Risk of thromboembolism and anticoagulation may be considered in those with left ventricular dysfunction. Implantable defibrillators may be needed in those with life threatening ventricular arrhythmias. This is a discussion on postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is characterized by orthostatic tachycardia in the absence of orthostatic hypotension. Criteria for diagnosis of POTS are as follows. 1. Heart rate increase more than or equal to 30 beats per minute from supine to standing. 2. Symptoms get worse with standing and better on lying down. 3. Symptoms lasting 6 months or more. 4. Absence of other overt causes of orthostatic symptoms or tachycardia like active bleeding, acute dehydration and medications. As children have higher orthostatic tachycardia, a cutoff of more than or equal to 40 beats per minute within 5 minutes of head up tilt has been suggested in young children. An orthostatic heart rate more than or equal to 130 beats per minute for ages 13 years and younger or more than or equal to 120 beats per minute for ages 14 years and older has also been suggested as additional criteria. Both cardiac and non-cardiac symptoms can occur in POTS. Cardiac symptoms include rapid palpitations lightheadedness, chest discomfort and dyspnea. Non-cardiac symptoms could be mental clouding, headache, nausea, tremulousness, blurred vision, poor sleep, exercise intolerance and fatigue. Fatigue resulting from activities of daily living such as bathing or household work can cause significant limitation of functional capacity. Large majority of patients are females in the age group 13 to 50 years. Lightheadedness was found to vary in them during the menstrual cycle and may be related to changes in estrogen levels. It was more during periods and less during follicular phase. They also reported an increase in estrogen related gynecological disease. Clinical examination may show features of mitral valve prolapse though significant mitral regurgitation is rare. Dependent acrocyanosis is a striking physical finding which occurs in 40 to 50 percent of patients. A dark red blue discoloration of legs which are cold to touch can be seen. Two important phenotypes of pods are the neuropathic pods and central hyperadrenergic pods. Partial sympathetic denervation especially of the legs with less norepinephrine release in the lower extremities has been documented in some patients with neuropathic POTS. Excessive sympathetic discharge may be the underlying mechanism in central hyperadrenergic POTS.
they often have extremely high levels of upright plasma norepinephrine. These patients may benefit from central sympathetics like methyl dopa and clonidine. Peripheral beta adrenergic blockers may also be useful in these patients. Some patients with pods present with episodic flushing and have coexistent mast cell activation as evidenced by increase in urinary methyl histamine. Pheochromocytoma can be considered in the differential diagnosis of POTS because of paroxysmal palpitation, but they are more likely to have symptoms in the supine position and have high plasma norepinephrine levels. Plasma or urine levels of metanephrines have about 98% sensitivity for detecting pheochromocytomas. Halter monitoring may be useful in excluding paroxysmal arrhythmia in case of paroxysmal palpitation. Sometimes the symptoms of POTS may be mistaken for anxiety disorder and panic disorder. Neurally mediated syncope or vasovagal syncope can have symptoms similar to POTS, particularly in the immediate presyncopal phase. Here are the first set of relevant journal references. Second set of references are here. These are the third set of references. Review of PRAMI trial on infarct related artery versus multivessel PCA in ST elevation myocardial infarction. Preventive angioplasty in myocardial infarction trial was conducted at five centers in the United Kingdom between 2008 and 2013. The study enrolled 465 patients with acute ST elevation myocardial infarction including three with left bundle branch block. Patients undergoing infarct related artery or culprit artery percutaneous coronary intervention were randomized to either preventive PCI or no preventive PCI. After primary PCA, subsequent PCA was recommended only for refractory angina with objective evidence of myocardial ischemia. Primary outcome measure in the PRAMI trial was a composite of death from cardiac causes, non-fatal myocardial infarction or refractory angina. Patients with cardiogenic shock, previous CABG or candidates for CABG and those with only an additional chronic total occlusion were excluded from the study. The trial was stopped prematurely by the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee as conclusive evidence was obtained. Primary outcome occurred in 21 patients in the preventive PCA group and 53 patients in the no preventive PCA group during a mean follow-up of 23 months. The study authors concluded that in STEMI patients with multivessel coronary artery disease, preventive PCI in non-infarct coronary arteries with major stenosis significantly reduce the risk of adverse cardiovascular events. It may be noted that as per study protocol, there was no option for a staged PCA for the non-infarct related arteries in the study. Repeat PCA was only driven by refractory angina with objective evidence of myocardial ischemia. The analysis was on intention to treat basis. There was an absolute reduction of 14% and relative reduction of 65% in the primary outcome measures of the trial. The results of as-treated analysis were similar to those of intention to treat analysis in this study. Another prior study had evaluated staged PCA option in addition to culprit vessel PCA and immediate multivessel PCA. That study had lesser number of patients and concluded that Culprit vessel only PCI had the highest rate of long term major adverse cardiovascular events. Patients scheduled for staged PCI had MACE rates similar to those undergoing simultaneous PCI of non infarct related artery. A systematic review of multi vessel versus culprit vessel only revascularization in STEMI with multi vessel coronary artery disease has been published. They noted that multivessel disease may be present in about half of patients with STEMI. This meta-analysis included 10 randomized controlled trials representing 7,030 patients.
there was no significant difference in the all-cause mortality between the two study groups. There was lower risk for cardiovascular mortality and repeat revascularization with multivessel PCI. Major bleeding, stroke and contrast induced nephropathy were not significantly different between the two groups. Multivessel PCI was associated with a 31% lower risk of reinfarction with no significant difference in all cause mortality. But this does not apply to those in cardiogenic shock as culprit shock trial had shown increased mortality with multivessel PCI. Discussion on Prevention of Rheumatic Fever Prevention of rheumatic fever can be approached at three levels. 1. Primordial Prevention 2. Primary Prevention 3. Secondary Prevention Primordial Prevention is preventing the development of risk factors in the community to prevent the disease in the population and thus protect individuals. Improvement in Socioeconomic Status Prevention of overcrowding, prevention of undernutrition and malnutrition, availability of prompt medical care and public education regarding the risk of rheumatic fever from sore throat, especially below the age of 15 years, are the measures for primordial prevention. Primary prevention of rheumatic fever is theoretically feasible, but practically almost impossible to achieve at the community level. It can be practiced on an individual basis by identification of group A beta hemolytic streptococcal sore throat and use of penicillin to eradicate the streptococci from the throat. Improving public awareness regarding danger of rheumatic fever from sore throat, identification of sore throat as being streptococcal and use of injectable penicillin to cure the streptococcal infection are the measures which are likely to be useful. Primary prevention is difficult to achieve because of the following factors. Only 3 to 20 percent of sore throats are streptococcal in origin. Of these, only 0.3 to 3 percent result in rheumatic fever. If 10,000 sore throats are treated, of which 300 to 2,000 will be streptococcal, it will prevent rheumatic fever in 1 to 6 children. Hence, primary prevention is not a feasible option at the community level. Primary prevention is quite difficult to achieve. Oral penicillin may not be effective in preventing rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever occurred in 15 to 48% of children given oral penicillin for 10 days in a US epidemic. 400,000 units of procaine penicillin twice daily for 10 days may be needed. Group A beta hemolytic streptococci are uniformly sensitive to penicillin, but penicillin is effective only on rapidly multiplying bacteria. After rapid division, group A beta hemolytic streptococci may reach a stationary phase due to limited nutrients in the local milieu. This can lead to a relative resistance to penicillin. Secondary prevention of rheumatic fever is the only viable preventive strategy. Options are Pensathin penicillin G 1.2 million units every 4 weeks administered intramuscularly. In high risk situations, administration every three weeks is justified and recommended or penicillin V 250 milligram twice daily orally or sulfadiacin 0.5 gram once daily for patients less than 27 kg orally 1 gram once daily for patients more than 27 kg for individuals allergic to penicillin and sulfadiacin erythromycin 250 milligram twice daily orally American Heart Association recommended duration for secondary prevention of rheumatic fever are as follows. Rheumatic fever with carditis and residual heart disease for at least 10 years since the last episode and at least until age 40 years, sometimes lifelong prophylaxis. Rheumatic fever with carditis but no residual heart disease, no valvular disease, clinical or echocardiographic evidence. 10 years or 21 years, whichever is longer. Rheumatic fever without carditis, 5 years or until 21 years of age, 
whichever is longer. Before stopping prophylaxis, an individual's risk of exposure to streptococcal infection should be considered. Teachers, parents of young children and healthcare providers are at higher risk. Poor housing condition and overcrowding increase the risk of transmission of streptococcal infections. Hence, there is a variation in the duration of prophylaxis recommended by different countries. Benzathine penicillin injection is the cornerstone of secondary prevention of rheumatic fever. But adverse reactions in patients with advanced disease and difficulties in procurement are important challenges. Rationale for secondary prophylaxis in rheumatic fever In an epidemic of streptococcal infection, 3% develop rheumatic fever while in an endemic infection, only 0.3% develop rheumatic fever. In an episode of rheumatic fever, 42% develop carditis while 58% do not. Of those with carditis, 66% develop residual rheumatic heart disease. This would mean that more than a quarter of those who develop rheumatic fever can end up with residual rheumatic heart disease. In those without obvious carditis initially, up to 8% may manifest heart disease later. In individuals with a previous history of rheumatic fever, 60% develops a recurrence of rheumatic fever with a second streptococcal infection. Of those with a previous rheumatic carditis, 72% develops carditis during the recurrent episode, while 29% do not. In those without carditis in the initial episode of rheumatic fever, only 7% develop carditis in the recurrent episode, while 93% do not. The high recurrence of rheumatic fever and carditis with recurrent streptococcal infection is the basis for secondary prophylaxis of rheumatic fever with penicillin. Fortunately, group A beta hemolytic streptococci, which cause rheumatic fever, has not developed resistance to penicillin except for the eagle effect. Hence, it is possible to prevent rheumatic fever by giving penicillin prophylaxis. Search for an effective anti-streptococcal vaccine has been going on for decades. Still, there is no vaccine which has been approved for human use. It is well known that school children are more affected by streptococcal infections than adults. This is because adults acquire some protection due to repeated infections in childhood and accumulation of protective antibodies against type-specific regions of M protein or conserved M epitopes. Conserved antigens are antigens shared by most or all serotypes. M protein cross reacts with the myocardium and hence an M protein based vaccine for prevention of rheumatic fever may not be safe. It may trigger an autoimmune response and lead to exactly the same disease it is meant to prevent that is acute rheumatic fever with carditis. M protein is strain specific and strains may vary from place to place. Mutations can occur in weeks, making the anti-streptococcal vaccine ineffective. Hence, an effective anti-streptococcal vaccine for prevention of rheumatic fever is difficult to develop. Another obstacle is that rheumatic fever occurs mainly in the underprivileged world. Hence, it may be difficult to recover the huge cost of vaccine development even if one is developed. Here is an important journal reference. Second set of references are here. Discussion on important aspects of prosthetic valve endocarditis. Prosthetic valve endocarditis is a serious disease with unfavorable outcome. Staphylococcus aureus is the commonest organism in prosthetic valve endocarditis. More complications like paravalvular leak and abscess formation are more common with prosthetic valve endocarditis. Fortunately, the incidence of early prosthetic valve endocarditis has come down due to better perioperative care and infection control. There is a difference between mechanical and bioprosthetic valves. The mechanical valves do not allow the adherence of the organism unless there is a thrombus. The infection is most often in the region of the annulus and causes myocardial invasion and abscess, but is less likely to produce valvular obstruction. More of paravalvular problems are likely with mechanical prosthesis. Bioprosthetic valves have a higher rate of infections 
and resembles that of a native valve endocarditis. Transthoracic echocardiography has a yield of only 15% in mechanical processes as it is the annulus which is most often involved. Transesophageal echocardiography is much better for the detection of vegetations and even small periprosthetic leaks. Abscesses and unstable processes are better detected by TEE. Staph and fungal endocarditis is more common with early prosthetic valve endocarditis. Surgical therapy has an edge over medical therapy for the treatment of prosthetic valve endocarditis. Large vegetations is one of the reasons while mechanical complications and fungal endocarditis are better treated surgically. Biofilm over the wall prevent penetration of antibiotics. Micro abscesses which are more common with staph aureus endocarditis also prevent proper medical treatment. Rifampicin is one drug which can penetrate the biofilm and micro abscesses. Vangomycin and oxacillin are two good drugs commonly used in the treatment of prosthetic valve endocarditis. Gentamicin is also useful. Linisolid is often used as a bailout drug in very sick patients who cannot be given vancomycin due to renal problems. International collaboration on endocarditis from Duke University, the pioneers in endocarditis research reported that a little less than half of the thousand odd patients with prosthetic valve endocarditis underwent early surgery while the rest underwent medical therapy. They found that after adjustment for clinical factors and survivor bias, early surgery for prosthetic valve endocarditis was not associated with lower in-hospital or one-year mortality. But prosthetic valve endocarditis did have a high one-year mortality rate. Indications for surgery in prosthetic valve endocarditis has been discussed in another video on this channel. 3D echocardiography and CT are evolving modalities for diagnosis of prosthetic valve endocarditis. PCR has a high yield for detection of prosthetic valve endocarditis compared with conventional blood culture. Because of dense acoustic shadowing related to the components of the prosthetic valve, role of echocardiography is often limited in the diagnosis of prosthetic valve endocarditis. Positron emission computer tomography is being used more often in detecting foci of active inflammation or metabolism in infective endocarditis. One study used 18 fluorodeoxyglucose PET CT in 92 patients. The study also had patients with cardiac implantable device related infections as they also had similar diagnostic problem with echocardiography. Supplementing Duke's criteria with 18 fluorodeoxyglucose PET CT increase the sensitivity from 52% to 91% with a slight fall in specificity from 95% to 89%. The authors further noted that reclassification from possible endocarditis to either definite or rejected category could be done in 95% which has great clinical significance. This would permit early initiation of antibiotic therapy in definite cases while avoiding unnecessary prolonged antibiotic therapy in rejected cases. There was an additional value in combining CT angiography with PET CT by enabling detection of larger number of anatomical lesions associated with active endocarditis than non-enhanced PET CT. A comparison of prosthetic valve endocarditis in transcatheter aortic valve replacement versus surgical aortic valve replacement has been published. Pooled cohort of all patients in Partner 1 and Partner 2 trials were analyzed with a total of 8530 patients among whom there were 107 cases of prosthetic valve endocarditis. They found no difference in the incidence of prosthetic valve endocarditis between tower and surgical AVR. Predictors in both groups were renal, lung and liver disease. Most cases in both groups occurred between 31 days and 1 year. Most important finding was that prosthetic valve endocarditis was associated with a more than fourfold risk of death. In this study, early prosthetic valve endocarditis was defined as before 30 days, 31 days to 1 year as intermediate and beyond 1 year as late. Here are the first set of journal references.
second set of journal references are here. Discussion on indications for surgery in prosthetic valve endocarditis also covers the concept of biofilm in infective endocarditis. Prosthetic valve endocarditis is a life-threatening situation and often can be refractory to medical therapy requiring surgical intervention. Indications for surgery in prosthetic valve endocarditis include the following. 1. Persistent bacteremia after 7 to 10 days. 2. Heart failure. 3. Early prosthetic valve endocarditis. 4. Fungal endocarditis. 5. Paravalla leak. 6. Annular or aortic abscess. 7. True or false aneurysm. 8. Fistula formation. 9. New onset conduction disturbance. 10. Recurrent peripheral embolization despite therapy. A best evidence topic review suggested that unless patient is a poor surgical candidate, surgery is the treatment of choice in prosthetic valve endocarditis. They recommended early surgery if there is hemodynamic instability, heart failure, valvular dysfunction, dehiscence or annular abscess. In addition, they recommended early surgery for prosthetic valve endocarditis due to Staphylococcus aureus. PALSU score has been developed by Spanish collaboration on endocarditis to predict in-hospital prognosis for valve surgery in endocarditis. PALSU score parameters are prosthetic valve, age 70 years or more, large intracardiac destruction, staphylococcus, urgent surgery, female gender, and a Euro score of 10 or more. They noted a mortality rate of 45.4% in patients with PALSU score above 3. Even though heart failure is an important reason for urgent surgery in prosthetic valve endocarditis, it need not indicate a bad prognosis. Large vegetations and uncontrolled infection are considered the main factors associated with high in-hospital mortality in those undergoing urgent surgery. In-hospital mortality was 41% in this series with 46 patients having left-sided infective endocarditis. 35% in-hospital mortality for surgery in prosthetic valve endocarditis has been reported by Rakik and colleagues. Most organisms causing infective endocarditis can produce a nearly impenetrable barrier around them called a biofilm. Biofilm is an extracellular polysaccharide slime-like matrix which can protect the organisms from the host immune mechanisms. It also impedes the efficacy of antimicrobial agents due to poor penetration. Surgery for prosthetic valve endocarditis mechanically disrupts the biofilm and exposes the viable microorganisms to antibiotics and the host immune system. In addition to this, surgery also removes infected tissue and foreign material. A full course intravenous antimicrobial therapy is needed after surgery for complete clearance of the organisms. Here are the first set of references on surgery in prosthetic valve endocarditis. Second set of references are here. Discussion on the role of Valsalva maneuver in cardiology. The initial description of Valsalva maneuver was published by Valsalva in 1704. It was forced expiratory effort against the closed glottis nose and mouth lasting for a few seconds. The maneuver was employed with the aim of expelling foreign bodies or exudates from the middle ear. Even today, otolaryngologists use variations of the maneuver very often. Weber in 1851 detailed the cardiovascular changes associated with maneuver making it useful for diagnostic purpose. Hence, some authors prefer to call it as Valsalva Weber Maneuver. Classical four phases of Valsalva Maneuver and its hemodynamic effects were described by Hamilton and colleagues in 1936. In 1947, Rushma made the assessment objective by expiratory straining against the mercury column of a sigma manometer. Later, this was changed to an analog manometer for better convenience. The subject is asked to take a full inspiration and blow against the resistance of a mouthpiece connected to an aneroid manometer to maintain a pressure of 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury for 15 to 20 seconds. 
it is then released and normal respiration resumed without gasping. Venous return decreases during the strain phase and reduces blood pressure which triggers baroreceptor mediated increase in heart rate. After cessation of straining, there is abrupt reversal resulting in overshoot of arterial pressure which is known as Valsalva overshoot. This leads to baroreceptor mediated bradycardia. Finally, the hemodynamic changes return to basal levels. While feeling the pulse during a Valsalva maneuver, it is easy to appreciate the bradycardia during phase 4. Classical four phases of Valsalva maneuver can be better documented by invasive intra-arterial pressure recording along with electrocardiographic monitoring. Phase 1 is associated with transient rise in arterial pressure and bradycardia at the beginning of strain due to increase in intrathoracic pressure. Phase 2 is the maintenance of straining with progressive decrease in arterial pressure and reflex tachycardia. Phase 3 is release of strain with a transient dip in arterial pressure with tachycardia. Phase 4 is the phase of post-training arterial pressure overshoot associated with bradycardia. Valsalva maneuver is used in clinical cardiology for ascertaining the origin of various cardiac murmurs. Typical example is differentiating the murmurs of aortic stenosis and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Murmur of aortic stenosis decreases due to the reduced left ventricular end diastolic volume. But a reduced end diastolic volume worsens the obstruction in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and accentuates the murmur. Therapeutic use of Valsalva maneuver in termination of supraventricular tachycardia is well known. Sometimes it is useful in elucidating the mechanism of supraventricular tachycardia. Valsalva maneuver is used in the assessment of cardiac autonomic function. Valsalva ratio is the ratio of maximal tachycardia to maximal bradycardia induced by the maneuver. RR intervals from an ECG monitor can be used for this purpose. Valsalva delay is the time for the maximum RR interval variation from phase 3 to phase 4. Choir wave response is the absence of the typical declining slope of the arterial pressure in the strain phase. This is because the preload of an overloaded left ventricle does not decrease significantly. Arterial pressure increases with strain and returns to normal on release of strain. Here are the first set of journal references on Valsalva maneuver. Second set of references. This is a discussion on broken heart syndrome or Takoshubo cardiomyopathy. Takoshubo cardiomyopathy is characterized by left ventricular epical ballooning and normal coronary arteries. It typically occurs after a high catecholamine stress, mostly in elderly females, after loss of spouse. LV shape is similar to the octopus pot, a traditional Japanese octopus trap. It is also known by various names as broken heart syndrome, stress cardiomyopathy, ampulla cardiomyopathy, and epical ballooning syndrome. ECG changes and clinical presentation may mimic acute myocardial infarction. Severe left ventricular dysfunction may occur. But most cases, though not all of them, eventually make a good recovery. Broussard's hypothesis on preferential left ventricular epical involvement in Takoshubo cardiomyopathy. Takoshubo cardiomyopathy is also known as epical ballooning syndrome because of preferential involvement of the left ventricular apex. Broussard's hypothesis on preferential involvement of the left ventricular apex in Takoshubo cardiomyopathy has to do with the trabeculation pattern of the left ventricle. According to Broussard, left ventricular apex is the most trabeculated and thinnest portion of the left ventricle. The resulting higher surface area to volume ratio would mean more of exposed endothelial surface lining the apex. This would make the apex more vulnerable to the effect of excessive catecholamines in the circulation which is known to damage the endothelial cells. Broussard presumes that the endothelial damage would lead on to transient contractile dysfunction 
in regions with high surface to volume ratio namely the apex of the left ventricle and some regions of the right ventricle leading to apical ballooning cardiomyopathy but this would not explain the mid ventricular variant of takoshiba cardiomyopathy and the inverted takoshiba cardiomyopathy inverted takoshiba cardiomyopathy is a variant of takoshiba cardiomyopathy in which there is hyperkinesis of apex with mid ventricular ballooning unlike the reverse pattern seen in classical takoshiba cardiomyopathy instead of the precordial st segment elevation inferior st segment elevation has been reported in these cases the presentation and clinical features of inverted takoshiba cardiomyopathy are similar to those of typical takoshiba cardiomyopathy the difference in pattern of involvement has been attributed to the variation in sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation of the heart a pattern similar to this has also been reported in subarachnoid hemorrhage a guideline published from japan in 2007 mentioned that inverted takoshiba cardiomyopathy should not be included in the diagnosis of takoshiba cardiomyopathy ramraj and colleagues collected the data of 60 cases from literature and found that classic type constituted 67% inverted type 23% and mid cavitary type 10% they noted that patients presenting with inverted takoshiba cardiomyopathy were significantly younger with mean age of 36 years compared to 62 years for the other types here are the first set of references on takoshiba cardiomyopathy these are the second set of references discussion on intertac diagnostic score and prognostic score for takoshiba cardiomyopathy intertac diagnostic score was developed from the results of international takoshiba registry by the intertac international registry group the score was developed for differentiating takoshiba cardiomyopathy from acute coronary syndrome in the acute stage Intertac diagnostic score estimates the probability for takoshiba cardiomyopathy and was found to have high sensitivity and specificity for differentiating it from acute coronary syndrome points allocated are as follows female gender 25 points emotional trigger 24 points physical trigger 13 points absence of st segment depression 12 points psychiatric disorders 11 points neurologic disorders 9 points qtc prolongation 6 points if 50 or more points were present the specificity of takoshiba cardiomyopathy was 95% if score was 31 or less the specificity of acute coronary syndrome was also 95% Intertac diagnostic score was evaluated in a study of 40 consecutive patients with acute coronary syndrome and 20 patients with takoshiba cardiomyopathy in a single center in Poland. They found highest sum of sensitivity and specificity while using a cutoff value of 45 points. With a score 50 or more, 85% were correctly diagnosed as takoshiba cardiomyopathy. When the score was 31 or less 92% were correctly diagnosed as acute coronary syndrome Intertac prognostic score aims at predicting short term and long term mortality in takoshiba syndrome data from the intertac registry which comprised of takoshiba syndrome patients from 26 centers worldwide was used for derivation of the score Regression coefficients of risk factors were obtained by Cox regression analysis. 1160 patients were included in the study. Intertac prognostic score gave points as follows: TTS secondary to neurologic disorders 15 points, TTS secondary to physical activities, medical conditions or procedures 9 points, age above 70 years 8 points systolic blood pressure less than 119 mm of mercury on admission 7 points diabetes mellitus 6 points 
left ventricular ejection fraction 45% or less on admission 6 points male sex 6 points heart rate above 94 per minute on admission 4 points TTS without an identifiable triggering factor 3 points the points were added together and those with 15 or less points were considered as low risk intermediate risk was assigned to those with 16 to 22 points high risk to those with 23 or 28 points and very high risk for those with 29 points or more five year survival in the lower risk group was 93.5 percent and that in the very high risk group was 45.1 percent survival in other groups were in between here are the first set of references. One more reference is here. Initial reports which caught attention were in elderly women who had lost their spouses and hence the term broken heart syndrome. As it involved the apical segments of the left ventricle, not conforming to any single vascular territory, another eponym was Epical Ballooning Syndrome. Recent work has questioned the complete reversal of cardiac pathology in this condition, though left ventricular ejection fraction rapidly returns to normal. They have noted long-term mortality comparable to that of myocardial infarction. Kelly and colleagues studied the long-term functional and metabolic changes after stress cardiomyopathy. 37 of their patients who had stress cardiomyopathy one year or more earlier completed the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire. They also underwent detailed clinical evaluation, biomarker estimation, echocardiography, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and phosphorus 31 magnetic resonance spectroscopy. They demonstrated long-lasting symptomatic and functional impairment in cardiac status after Takoshiba cardiomyopathy, even though left ventricular ejection fraction improved. This would suggest persistent long-term subclinical cardiac dysfunction. Pelicia and associates studied the predictors of long-term prognosis in a meta-analysis. They included 54 studies with a total of 4,679 patients, of which 477 were females and 602 were males. They found that older age presence of a physical stressor and atypical ballooning were the predictors of unfavorable long-term outcome. There were 104 recurrences indicating an annual recurrence rate of 1%. Annual mortality rate was 3.5%. Of the 4,567 patients who survived the index admission, 103 died of cardiac causes and 351 died of non-cardiac causes over a mean follow-up period of 28 months. There were 112 deaths, that is 2.4% during admission. Prognosis was poorer in secondary Takoshiba cardiomyopathy with a physical stressor compared to primary Takoshiba cardiomyopathy with an emotional stressor. Here are the important references for the topic. Some more references are here. Discussion on surgery for tetralogy of fallow. Tetralogy of fallow is the commonest cyanotic congenital heart disease. Surgical repair has improved remarkably ever since it was first published in 1995 by Lilihe and colleagues. Excellent long term survival is now feasible with 30 year survival ranging from 68.5% to 90.5%. Symptomatic infants with tetralogy of fallow can undergo either primary surgical repair or a palliative procedure which could be either a systemic to pulmonary shunt or catheter based right ventricular outflow tract or pulmonary wall dilatation. A retrospective study using the UK National Congenital Heart Disease Audit had 1662 infants with mean age of 181 days from 2000 to 2013. Of these, 1244 
underwent primary surgical repair, 311 surgical systemic to pulmonations, and 107 right ventricular outflow tract dilatation procedures. Mortality was higher in those who underwent primary repair before 60 days of age. Mortality at 12 years was 18.7% in those repaired before the age of 60 days versus 2.2% for those repaired after that. Right ventricular outflow tract dilatations were associated with more right ventricular outflow tract reinterventions and fewer pulmonary valve replacement at 12 years. They had lower mortality after complete repair. While considering procedures in early life, each has its own disadvantages. Early primary repair can increase the need for transannular patch and late morbidity, mostly due to pulmonary regurgitation. Surgical shunts have high rates of complications, while right ventricular outflow tract dilatation procedures are associated with wall lesions and reinterventions. Shunt surgeries are usually done as palliative procedures prior to surgical repair of cyanotic congenital heart disease to improve the pulmonary blood flow. Classic Blalock Tosic shunt was devised by cardiologist Helen B. Tosic and cardiac surgeon Alfred Blalock as a palliation for cases of tetralogy of fallow. The subclavian artery is divided and anastomosed to the pulmonary artery as an end to side anastomosis. Usually, it is done on the side opposite to the aortic arch because of the presence of the brachiocephalic trunk on that side prevents kinking of the subclavian when it is pulled into the thorax. Unilateral rib notching due to collaterals which develop to supply the arm can be seen in those who have undergone the shunt after several years. In modified Blalock shunt, a Gore-Tex graft is used to connect the subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery. Both these shunts are done to the branch pulmonary artery on the side of the shunt and approach is through a posterolateral thoracotomy. Schematic diagram of a modified Blalock toxic shunt in a person with right aortic arch and tetralogy of fallow is illustrated here. Waterston shunt is one of the older central aortopulmonary shunts connecting ascending aorta to right pulmonary artery. Central shunts have a higher chance of producing pulmonary hypertension later. Pod shunt connects the descending aorta to the left pulmonary artery. Both these central aortopulmonary shunts are side to side and prone for development of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease. They are only of historical interest. The initial surgical repair was by a ventriculotomy approach in the right ventricular anterior wall and transannular patch was used to relieve right ventricular outflow tract obstruction if needed. 26 to 31 year follow up of the first 106 patients was published in 1986. They mentioned that the first surgical correction was done on 31st August 1954. Initial 6 patients were operated by cross circulation and remaining 100 patients with bubble oxygenator. They noted that actuarial survival at 30 years was 77%. Actuarial freedom from reoperations at 30 years was 91%. An excellent aspect is that 32% completed college. 5 took master's degrees, 2 MDs, 2 PhDs and 1 lawyer. 40 patients had progeny with 93% live births and 6 major cardiac defects. To avoid a ventriculotomy, transatrial and transatrial transpulmonary approach is currently preferred for repair of tetralogy of fallow. In a long-term follow-up data of 453 patients who underwent transatrial transpulmonary repair at a median age of 0.6 years, survival was 97.3% at median follow-up of 14.3 years. Transannular patch was used in 65% of patients, though use declined over time from 89% initially to 64% later. Primary outcome measures in that retrospective analysis were death, pulmonary valve replacement, re-intervention for other reasons 
and implantation of a cardioverter defibrillator or pacemaker. Use of a transanular patch was a predictor for poorer event-free outcomes with 1.7 times risk of composite endpoint. Overall, 52 patients underwent pulmonary valve replacement and 5 had pacemaker insertion during follow-up in the study. This is a discussion on TASTE trial of thrombus aspiration with percutaneous coronary intervention. TASTE trial was a multi-center, prospective, randomized, open-label study which enrolled 7,244 patients from the Swedish Coronary Angiography and Angioplasty Registry. Patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction were assigned to either percutaneous coronary intervention with manual thrombus aspiration or PCA alone. Primary endpoint of the study was 30-day all-cause mortality. Mortality was 2.8% in the thrombus aspiration group and 3% in the PCA only group which was not a statistically significant difference. There were no statistically significant differences in 30-day rehospitalization, stent thrombosis, or rates of stroke or neurological complications at discharge. In a prior trial infuse AMI, manual thrombus aspiration was not found to be beneficial in those undergoing primary PCI with bivalvidine anticoagulation. In fact, size at 30 days was significantly reduced by bolus intracoronary abscissimab. In the TAPA study, Thrombus aspiration was shown to produce better reperfusion and clinical outcome at 30 days. One year outcome in terms of death and non fatal reinfarction was better in the thrombus aspiration group. But the number of patients in TAPAS trial was much smaller compared to TASTE trial. Some of the limitations of the TASTE trial were that it was an open label study and there was neither adjudication of events nor blinded review of angiograms. One year follow-up data of TASTE trial showed that routine thrombus aspiration before PCI in STEMI patients did not reduce the all-cause mortality or the composite of all-cause mortality, rehospitalization for myocardial infarction or stent thrombosis at one year. An individual patient meta-analysis from thrombectomy trialist collaboration also came to a similar conclusion. The meta-analysis included only large trials with more than 1000 participants. The trials included were TAPAS, TASTE and TOTAL with altogether 18,306 patients who underwent PCI. There were no significant differences in recurrent myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, heart failure or target vessel revascularization. In the subgroup with high thrombus burden, there was a trend towards reduced cardiovascular death and increased stroke or transient ischemic attack. Here are the first set of journal references. Second set of references are here. These are the third set of journal references. Discussion on ventricular tachycardia in structurally normal heart. VT in structurally normal heart constitutes about 10% of patients with ventricular tachycardia. Echocardiogram and coronary angiograms are normal in these cases, but MRI may show subtle abnormalities. Localized sympathetic denervation may be seen in some of them. Baseline ECG is normal in many situations. Following are the main types of VT with structurally normal heart. 1. Right ventricular outflow tract VT. 2. Left ventricular outflow tract VT 3. Idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia 4. Catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia 5. Ventricular tachycardia in Brugada syndrome 6. Ventricular tachycardia in Long QT syndrome The first three are monomorphic VT while the latter three are polymorphic in nature. Right ventricular outflow tract VT is a wide QRS tachycardia with LBBB pattern and inferior axis 
it occurs in third to fifth decade and constitutes about 90% of outflow VTs. There are two types, non-sustained repetitive variety and paroxysmal exercise induced sustained variety. Both are terminated by adenosine in contrast from VT in arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Exercise stress testing is used to initiate and evaluate RVOT VT. Initiation depends on a critical heart rate which differs in each patient. MRI may show abnormalities of right ventricle in up to 70% which include focal thinning, diminished systolic wall thickening and abnormal wall motion. Differential diagnosis of RVOT VT include ARVD, Mahim fiber tachycardia, antidromic AVRT using a right sided axillary pathway, and VT in patients after repair of tetralogy of fallow. Intracellular calcium overload is thought to be the mechanism which enhances function of sodium calcium exchanger, thereby increasing inward sodium current and delayed after depolarization which initiate tachycardia. Cyclic AMP regulates intracellular calcium. Increased levels of cyclic AMP will increase intracellular calcium levels. Adenosine acts by lowering cyclic AMP concentration. Beta blockers act by inhibiting adenylate cyclase which mediates the synthesis of cyclic AMP. Verapamil has its action by inhibiting L-type calcium channels. These are the mechanisms by which these drugs are effective in RVOTVT. RVOTVT occurring in repetitive runs having left bundle branch block morphology and inferior axis. RVOT tachycardia in children responsive to adenosine has been described. In these children, after termination of tachycardia with adenosine, verapamil was used effectively for prophylaxis against recurrence. Beta blockers verapamil or diltiasm can control RVOTVT with about 25 to 50 percent efficacy. Class 1A, 1C, 3 including amiodron have been tried in the treatment of RVOTVT. Radiofrequency catheter ablation has cure rates of 90 percent and is the preferable option given the young age of patients with RVOTVT. But some of the foci can have an origin very near the left main coronary artery and caution is needed while ablating these foci to prevent damage to the left main coronary artery. Simultaneous coronary angiography is needed to identify the relation of the mapping catheter to the left main in these situations. Left ventricular outflow tract VT is characterized by S waves in lead 1 and R wave transition in V1, V2 and constitutes about 10% of outflow VT. There are two varieties of LVOTVT, supravalvular and infravalvular. Absence of S wave in V5-V6 is suggestive of supravalvular origin, while the presence of S wave in V5-V6 indicates infravalvular origin. There is a risk of left main coronary artery occlusion while ablating LVOTVT. Hence, coronary angiography before, during, and after ablation is recommended. The ablation catheter tip has to be kept 1 cm away from the ostia of the coronary arteries. Idiopathic left ventricular tachycardias are verapamil sensitive fascicular tachycardias. Three types are described. RBBB left axis pattern originating from left posterior fascicle. RBBB right axis pattern originating from left anterior fascicle. And left fascicular tachycardia with normal axis. ILVT can be terminated with intravenous verapamil. Long term therapy with verapamil is also feasible. Radiofrequency catheter ablation is highly effective in those with severe symptoms. Identifying the focus of ablation can be achieved by the recognition of Perkini potential, late diastolic potential, or earliest ventricular activation. Perkini potentials are high frequency, short duration potentials preceding the QRS complex. They are also called P potential and diastolic potential. Perkini potentials can be recorded both in sinus rhythm and during VT. Pacing at sites of earliest P potential produces QRS identical to that of clinical tachycardia. They occur 30 to 40 milliseconds before the VT QRS complex. Primary ablation of ILVT 
has been suggested by some authors because fasciculavity is sometimes difficult to induce despite pharmacological provocation. Primary ablation has a higher success rate, lesser procedure time, lower fluoroscopy time and requires lesser number of RF energy deliveries. Catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is a bidirectional polymorphic VT which is induced by exercise or catecholamine infusion. Family history of premature SCD and stress related syncope is obtained in about a third of patients. Exercise or acute emotion triggers the syncope in CPVT. Symptoms typically manifest in childhood. CPVT has a genetic basis with 5 genetic types described so far. Rhinodian receptor 2 mutation is transmitted as an autosomal dominant trait, while cal sequestrin mutation is transmitted as an autosomal recessive variety. These two are designated as CPVT1 and CPVT2. Three other genetic types, CPVT3, CPVT4 and CPVT5 have also been documented. CPVT has been discussed in detail in another video on this channel. Beta blockers are the preferred therapy in CPVT. ICD may be required in 30% of patients, but a word of caution is needed since there is a risk of electrical storm with ICD discharges which can cause an emotional stress and a vicious cycle of CPVT and shocks. Brugada syndrome is characterized by an apparent RBBB pattern with ST elevation in V1 to V3 associated with life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias, typically polymorphic VT. There is a tendency for familial occurrence and it is associated with SCN5A mutation and several other mutations. Loss of the action potential dome in the epicardium but not endocardium causes the right precordial ST elevation in Brugada syndrome. Implantation of a cardioverted defibrillator is the only effective treatment though quinidine has been suggested in addition. There are at least 16 genotypes of long QT syndrome LQT1 to LQT3 as per OMIM database. Phenotypically, LQT1 has broad based T waves with indistinct onset while LQT2 has bifid T waves and LQT3 a long isoelectric ST segment. First and foremost in the treatment of long QT syndrome is the exclusion of acquired LQTS which is much more common. Avoidance of QT prolonging drugs is essential. Beta blockers are the most useful therapy in LQTS. ICD placement along with beta blocker therapy is the best option for secondary prevention in a case of long QT syndrome with history of arrhythmic syncope. Sodium channel blocking drugs like ranolazine, maxillotine and flecainide have been used in the treatment of LQT3 which is due to sodium channel SCN5A mutation. Here are the first set of references on the topic. Second set of references are here. Here is one more journal reference. This is a discussion on Verisigot for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Verisigot is a new medication for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It is an oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. Victoria trial evaluated the efficacy of the drug in a phase 3 double blind randomized placebo controlled trial. There were 5050 patients with chronic heart failure in NYCHEC functional class 2, 3 or 4 in this study. They had left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%. Verisigod with a target dose of 10 mg was evaluated in comparison with placebo. The medication was added over and above guideline based medical therapy. Primary outcome assessed was the composite of death from cardiovascular causes and hospitalization for heart failure. The median follow up was 10.8 months. Primary outcome occurred in 35.5% in Verisigod group and 38.5% in placebo group, 27.4% in the Verisigod group and 29.6% in the placebo group were hospitalized with heart failure during the study period.
Authors of the study concluded that among patients with high risk heart failure, the incidence of death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization for heart failure was lower among those who received verisigot. Based on this study report, US FDA approved verisigot for reducing risk of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization following a hospitalization for heart failure or need for outpatient intravenous diuretics in adults with symptomatic chronic heart failure and ejection fraction less than 45%. Socrates reduced randomized trial had shown that verisigot did not have a statistically significant effect on anti-proBNP level at 12 weeks of treatment. It was a dose-finding phase 2 study that randomized 456 patients. 351 patients had completed treatment with verisigot with valid 12-week anti-proBNP levels. Here are the first set of references. One more reference is here. Discussion on vital study on vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acid supplementation for potential role in prevention of cancer and cardiovascular disease. Role of vitamin D in cardiovascular disease has been suggested by observational studies. Low blood levels of vitamin D was found to be associated with higher risks of heart disease, stroke, hypertension and diabetes mellitus. But the 2011 Institute of Medicine guidance concluded that the evidence is inconsistent and inconclusive, not meeting the criteria for a cause-effect relationship. Vital study was a randomized placebo-controlled trial of vitamin D3 at a dose of 2000 international units per day and omega-3 fatty acids at a dose of 1 gram per day for prevention of cancer and cardiovascular disease. 25,871 participants were men aged 50 years or more and women aged 55 years or more in the United States. Primary endpoints of the study were invasive cancer of any type and major cardiovascular events which was a composite of myocardial infarction, stroke or death from cardiovascular causes. Secondary endpoints were site-specific cancer, death from cancer and additional cardiovascular events. Median follow-up period of the vital study was 5.3 years. 396 major cardiovascular events occurred in the vitamin D group and 409 in the placebo group. The difference was not statistically significant. Vitamin D supplementation did not result in a lower incidence of invasive cancer. There were no excess risks of hypercalcemia or other adverse events due to vitamin D supplementation in the study. No significant differences in the secondary cardiovascular endpoints or all-cause mortality was documented. The vitamin D assessment study from New Zealand reported on 5,108 participants given an oral vitamin D3 dose of 200,000 units followed by monthly doses of 100,000 units or placebo. The median follow-up period was 3.3 years. WIDA study concluded that monthly high-dose vitamin D supplementation did not prevent cardiovascular disease. Two-year post-intervention follow-up of vital study is looking for latency effects and possible increase in statistical power to assess endpoints. It was thought that detection of a decrease in death rate from any cause may need a longer follow-up. The study was funded by the National Institutes of Health of United States of America.